I call the meeting of the Senate Communications and Technology Committee to order. I'd like to welcome everyone to the third of four hearings of the Communications and Technology Committee to discuss how we can better improve access to high-speed broadband internet throughout the Commonwealth. And before we begin today, I would like to ask Senator Stefano to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. To the right. Good morning. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Senator Stefano, and thank you very much for offering to host this important hearing here in beautiful Fayette County. Also, before we begin, I would like to thank uh, the Pennsylvania Grange for providing us with a very important product that Pennsylvania produces, milk. So cheers to all of our dairy farmers across the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and how very appropriate as we're here to discuss um, how the lack of access to high-speed internet impacts the agricultural community as well as our education community. So this time last year, the number we all were using was approximately 800,000. That's the number of people believed to not have access to high-speed internet in the Commonwealth. Uh, we now know, thanks to the Center for Rural Pennsylvania, that actually only a small portion of Pennsylvania meets the Federal Communication Commission's minimum speed for broadband, and that is 25.3 megabytes per second. The number of people without access who have a discrepancy in actual speeds versus advertised speeds is actually in the millions. Marginal broadband connectivity is a commonwealth-wide problem, but the issue becomes exceedingly worse in places like Fayette County and throughout most of rural Pennsylvania. And that is why I knew it was imperative to hold these hearings with this committee to begin to examine the problem and find workable solutions. This particular hearing, as I said earlier, will dive deeper into agriculture and education and how a lack of broadband access impacts those specific areas. Earlier this summer, the governor signed a bill into law that allows for schools to utilize flexible instructional days in the case of bad weather or an other unforeseen emergency. One of the biggest things I heard after the passage of this bill was, what happens if the student does not have broadband internet at home? I made sure to include a provision in that bill that allows for schools to grant an accommodation in those cases, but I think the important thing to note is the fact that some students simply cannot do their homework at home. I can drive by schools in my district. I know that my colleagues here can say the same and see cars lined up in the parking lot hours before the school day ended or hours before the school day began or hours after the school day ended. And I remember asking the superintendent of one of those school districts, Southeastern New York School District, why that was. And her response was that the students can't complete their assignments at home, so they have to come to the school, sit in the parking lot, and use the school district's Wi-Fi. That same could be said for those commuter students who may want to live at home to save money and attend a community college. However, they have to stay at the school every evening to use their Wi-Fi because their parents may not have it at home. Additionally, I've heard from countless farmers and agriculture professionals in my district who tell me that they cannot utilize some of the new and upcoming technology that will really improve what they do because of the location of their rural homes. Cows wear Fitbits. I, we're going to hear later today from a, a, a sugar maple farmer who is going to tell you about how he uses new technology. And, you know, we can see that drones are watching over fields. They, their temperature and moisture sensors in, in the ground. All of these things are not possible if the farmer doesn't have good access to high-speed internet. We know that agriculture is one of the top industries here in Pennsylvania, and I think we need to be doing what we can to help them keep up with technology so that our largest industry continues to thrive. So uh, before we begin, I'd like to take a moment for members of the committee as well as the local representatives to introduce themselves. 
Um, and if we could begin with um, Senator Stefano, our host, followed by Senator Costa, who is standing in for our uh, committee chair, Senator Sanicero, who is unfortunately sends his regrets and is unable to join us here today. So Senator Stefano. Thank you, Senator. Again, I'm uh, Senator Pat Stefano. Welcome to my alma mater. Uh, this is where I went to school and I'm also now part of the advisory board. So this is the heart and soul of uh, my district. Uh, I want to take a moment to send some special thank yous. Thank you to uh, Dr. Patrick, Chancellor of the campus, for allowing us to uh, host the committee here meeting here today. I also want to say thank you to the Fayette County Commissioners, Vince Vesides and Dave Lohr. They are here. Somerset County Commissioner Gerald Walker. And I uh, also want to th thank Patty Yager from Congressman Reschenthaler's office for being here today. You know, what we talk about um, what the role of government is. And, the you know, I always said the role of government is that one of them is to help build infrastructure. Well, today we're going to talk about an infrastructure we can't see, but we definitely need to be working on building this this super highway that connects everyone and we're having some serious issues and we're going to talk about that today. So I thank all of you for being here today to be part of this discussion as we move Pennsylvania forward and getting everyone connected. So thank you and thank you for the committee and, and, and Chair, Chair, Chairwoman uh, Kristen Phillips Hill for hosting today. Well, thank you very much. My name is Jay Costa and I have the privilege of serving as a Democratic leader uh, in the state senate and i want to thank senator phillips hill for convening today's hearing here in fayette and certainly thank senator stefano for hosting us but also penn state uh, beautiful campus i will say i'm a pit person but that's beside the point it's always good to come to a beautiful campus like this but in any event i think to the topic of, of broadband in particular and infrastructure investments is extremely important we know the governor's been talking about a restore program but to me a critical part of that is in fact how we're able to reach out into our more rural parts of our, our commonwealth and making certain that folks have access to uh, the global economy. And I think, you know, whether it be Greene County, or, uh, the Representative Snyder represents, or here in Fayette, um, folks need access to the appropriate level of broadband, certainly for the, the economy and also the opportunity to participate. But as someone who serves on a couple of different university and college boards, uh, I know firsthand the role that distance learning plays, whether it be at the undergraduate level, certainly, but also in the level of high school, for example. Distance learning courses are becoming more and more a part of, the, of what's taking place, and we have to make certain that we have access, that folks have access to be able to participate along those lines as well. So this is an important conversation. This will be the second one I participated in, and I do send regrets and regards from Senator Sanicero, who's feeling a little bit under the weather right now, and is not able to make it with us today. But uh, thank you, Senator, for convening these meetings and these hearings, because they're very important. Thank you. Hi, I'm State Senator Scott Hutchinson. <clears throat> I represent a, a very rural area in, in north and western portions of, of Pennsylvania, the 21st Senatorial District, uh, which includes all of Venango, Clarion, Forest, most of Warren County, and a big portion of Butler counties. And certainly want to thank uh, Senator Phillips Hill for shining a spotlight on the importance of, of broadband access in our rural areas. And I also want to thank uh, Senator Stefano for hosting this hearing today, and I look forward to uh, uh, great discussions. Thank you very much. We're also very fortunate to have several members of the State House of Representatives here, and if they could introduce themselves, we'd really appreciate it. Good morning. My name's Pam Snyder, and I represent the 50th District, which encompasses all of Greene County, a portion of Fayette, and a portion of Washington counties. I want to thank Chairman Kristen Phillips Hill. Uh, this is an issue that's very near and dear to my heart. And she and I started this journey together when she was in the House and we served together there. And it is such an honor now to have her in the Senate so that we can be that, have that partnership. Tag team. Yeah, tag team. Uh, the reality is in 2019, you cannot compete if you cannot connect. It is simply that simple. So this is not an easy issue. It's very difficult. And these types of conversations enable us as legislators to be able to formulate ideas, see what policy changes need to occur so that we can provide internet, not just to the inner cities, but to all of Pennsylvanians. And 
in rural Pennsylvania, that's a huge challenge. So again, thank you all for being here. I look forward to the testimony, and I look forward to all of us working together to find the solutions we need. I'm Ryan Warner. I represent the 52nd District, which we were in right now. I'm very proud to have Penn State Fayette in the district, uh, along with Senator Stefano. I am, this is also my alma mater. I attended uh, school and played baseball here. I'm very appreciative for, again, Penn State for their commitment to our community and what they do, not just with this hearing, but on uh, collaboration with us and the Senator has been tremendous. Uh, I, I just want to thank Senator Phillips Hill, Senator Stefano for hosting this hearing. Uh, it's hard for me to call Senator Phillips Hill. I do miss her in the House. She was a great ally for us. But uh, I think this is fantastic to have both the House and Senate together for a hearing because ultimately to get anything passed, we have to do it together. So to work in collaboration like this, uh, you know, I think this is a very good thing. I'd like to see more of it in the future. This is an issue that I've heard a lot about uh, representing a mainly rural district. So I look forward to the information that we're going to learn here today. Thank you. From the 49th District, parts of Fayette, Washington County, the Mon Valley State Rep. Bud Cook. Uh, I'd like to echo all the thank yous and the uh, joint participation. Uh, one of the realizations that we need to come to is we operate in an economy where here does not mean here anymore. We're not only competing at the state level, the national level, it's international. And uh, in order for us to move forward, it's this access that we must achieve. So thank you for the opportunity to participate on this very important issue. Well, thank you very much to, for all the kind words from our colleagues. It was wonderful to have you all here today. So I'd like to kick things off with our first panel and joining us today are Gary Seely, school director and treasurer, Brownsville Area School District. Mr. Paul Allison, Associate Vice President for IT at California University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Nicholas Newpower, President of Butler County Community College. And Mr. Jeff Medvick, Manager of Information Services right here at Penn State Fayette. And Dr. Nicholas Rosendale, Executive Director of Beaver Valley Intermediate Unit Number 27 and Chairman of PAIU Net. So, gentlemen, thank you all for being here today, and, and we'll start with your opening remarks, and I would ask you that, if you could, kindly summarize as much as possible so that we have ample time for the many questions that I know that my colleagues will have for you following all of your opening remarks. So if, if we could begin with Mr. Seeley, and we'll just work down the line, it would be really appreciated. Thank you. Mr. Seeley. Wait, wait. Ah, there we go. Better. Good morning. My name's Gary Seely, and I am a school director at Brownsville Area School District uh, here in Fayette County. I have been asked by the Pennsylvania School Board Association to share my perspectives with you today regarding the need to expand access to broadband internet services, especially as it impacts schools, students, and families. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you today. Before I begin my comments, I would like to thank Senator Phillips Hill, and although not here, Senator Santasoro as chair and minority chair for their leadership and willingness to bring this issue back to the public, or back to the table for public comment. I would also like to thank Senator Stefano for hosting this particular hearing. It is my understanding that these specific hearings today are addressing the lack of rural broad broadband access uh, in the Commonwealth. The reality is that uh, this conversation was, or this issue was an, uh, a, a, a prominent over two decades ago uh, under then President Bill Clinton as the term digital divide uh, uh, came about. While the technology and the definitions may have changed, uh, but the basic issue has not. Does every household in Pennsylvania have access 
to high speed internet at this point we know that the answer is no as a as i began preparing my testimony i quickly became aware that i knew really little about this particular issue other than that the digital divide is real i started reading article articles and and one of those articles by eleanor bader and published in truth out dot org entitled technology access gap leaves millions of students struggling to keep up there were several testimonials of how school students survive high school students survived without having access to internets in their home so i thought i'd take a course of action and and go to my home school and maybe try to identify a student who was experiencing the same issue so i talked with some of the teachers and it became evident that yes they do exist but the teachers were unable to of course give me their names because the students went to them either before class or after class uh, and and told them that they did not have access to internet in their home and they did so because they were embarrassed um, and so i kind of asked the teacher i said well do you have us homework assignments that you um, would like to or or do require uh, internet access and the answer really i feel was fortunate uh, because the colleagues that at our particular school do then while they have homework that does require access they give students time in class uh, or go to the lab to use the internet to complete their homework that does have an impact because it takes away from class time um, but it, it maintains and keeps that, that uh, level, <coughs> excuse me, that level of uh, trust uh, that, the, that the teacher needs to have, it, it keeps it there. Um, so I, I even, um, well, oh, as one of the policy makers of my uh, school district, I struggled to answer the question in what we are doing to help a student or students uh, in this particular situation. As treasurer and finance chair, I'm very much aware of, of the district's struggle, struggles to meet the day-to-day -day expenses. So the answer was clear. At this point, we are doing nothing to help that student who doesn't have access to internet in their home uh, other than take away from class time. So I felt the need to further educate myself, and one of the suggested readings was a report that was, has been mentioned, prepared by the team of researchers from Penn State University for the Center of Rural Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania titled Broadband Availability and Access in Rural Pennsylvania. I must assume, or I hope you have, uh, that each of you on the panel have read this report, and it may well have been the motivation uh, needed to conduct these particular hearings as I read the report the task before us is enormous if we are to succeed assuring every Pennsylvania household and business has access to broadband um, if, if we are to succeed the the report seemed to me to be very unbiased but eye-opening it conveyed conveyed that in February 2019 the FCC issued a press release stating that two-thirds of Americans have access to 250 megabytes per second and that 90% of Americans have access to uh, high-speed sp high internet at 100 megabytes per second. Based on the testing of uh, over 11 million individual tests in Pennsylvania conducted by the Penn State research team, there are very few areas in Pennsylvania where the median internet speeds uh, meet the minimum criteria set by the FCC uh, as broadband connectivity, and that is only at 25 megabytes per second. The research has been made public, and it is hoped that other states will adopt the methods to obtain 
uh, a more accurate measure of internet speeds. The FCC currently relies on self-reporting data from the ISPs. Uh, this met the method used by the Penn State research teams tends to nullify, nullify the ISP data. The Penn State report presents options that may be used to move forward and identify many of the hurdles that will be faced in order to make broadband service available to Pennsylvanians. I certainly concur with the report and Indiana County Commissioner uh, Rod, Rod Ruddick's testimony last month at a similar hearing that government and industry must partner to make broadband availability a reality. Based on the complexity of this issue, government is not restricted to the state of Pennsylvania and industry is not limited to the technology corridor. A 2016 MIT study found that communities in, in which mass market broadband was available experienced more rapid growth in employment, number of businesses overall, and businesses in IT. Therefore, all businesses should benefit from broadband service and need to be part of the solution. Although I'm now retired, I spent my entire 38-year career working with students from disadvantaged backgrounds and worked in the uh, public sector of higher education. Therefore, when I read that a study by investigative report workshop at American University found that the best values for broadband services were in the most affluent areas, I became alarmed and sickened by that particular statement or that uh, the results of that study. I believe that consumer cost should also be a part of the discussion to expand broadband service. You see, it won't matter if broadband service is available in every household in Pennsylvania if families cannot afford it. This is particular a concern of the students in attending Brownsville schools. I believe that we are the only district in Fayette County that is eligible to receive 100% reimbursement for student lunches. Our district is eligible based on USDA's formula since 62.6% of our students are directly certified, meaning that they receive SNAP or TANF. I would dare say that most of the other districts located in Fayette County are not far behind. They're, therefore, even if broadband issue is resolved, if families cannot afford the cost, the digital divide still remains. This would, could have d devastating consequences regarding Pennsylvania and our nation's ability to comp compete in the global market. In closing, I would like to thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. Uh, let's work together to solve this issue once and for all. Thank you, Mr. Seeley. Mr. Allison, if you could speak into the microphone so the folks at home who are watching can hear. Thank you. Hi, my name is Paul Allison, and I'm the Associate Vice President for Information Technology at California University of Pennsylvania. Uh, first, let me start by thanking uh, Chairwoman Phillips Hill, uh, the committee members, senators, and representatives. Access to higher education and resources to support success in attaining that education directly contributes to regions' economic and overall well-being. Broadband availability in a region has a major impact on the ability of the people to access and successfully complete educational programs in a variety of ways. Being the largest online education provider in the Pennsylvania state system, California University of Pennsylvania sees those effects from the online, on-campus, and commuter perspective. The first barrier, uh, the, I'm sorry, the first barrier uh, presented by poor or non-existent broadband is seen in the application process. Most institutions utilize online applications for admissions into programs. Students will need to have a strong broadband service to complete the application process. Completing the application process will likely require submitting larger documents. 
Without broadband service, students may be unable to complete the college application or miss deadlines for scholarships and financial aid. Once admitted, online students face many challenges without broadband access. Course content, interactive learning tools, student exam identity authentication, supplemental materials download, and course assignment submission are all bandwidth intensive activities and a slow home or library internet connection will hinder or in some cases prevent the student from those activities. Commuter students, which account for a large percentage of the student population from broadband deficient areas, also face challenges. College courses require significant out of classroom technology use to complete assignments and to interact with peers. Students who are already juggling jobs and family now have to either spend more time on campus or drive to locations where broadband is readily accessible. Lack of broadband access greatly increases the likelihood that a student will not complete their degree program. In summary, if our rural communities are to survive and preferably thrive, it is critical that we enable and enhance the educational opportunities for their residents. Education broadens our thinking and exposes us to new possibilities. Each new idea, new product, new service fuels the success of the community. Expansion of broadband access will allow more students from disadvantaged communities to pursue higher education who may not be able to do so otherwise. Providing broadband service to rural communities will ensure each student has equal opportunity to apply for colleges and be considered for all financial aid available to them. While there have been great advances in readily available computer technology, such as a $200 tablet, there is still a large gap in getting people online and connected. Broadband access would open a world of opportunity for students in inaccessible areas, creating the possibility of mobility and advancement for the geographically and socioeconomically challenged. Thank you for your time and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Allison. Dr. Newpower. Thank you and good morning to everyone. Very much appreciate the opportunity to speak before this esteemed group. I do so as a, a longtime president of the Butler County Community College, but also as one of 14 community college presidents in our Commonwealth. Butler County Community College opened its doors in September of 1966 to 431 students. That came a couple of years, few years after the passage of the Community College Act in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. That act, also known as Act 484, was passed in August of 1963. Interestingly, that original Community College Act called for 28 community colleges across our Commonwealth. As I mentioned earlier, today we have 14 community colleges. Those 14 community colleges service over 300,000 individuals in a variety of capacities in the educational setting. We do so not just in our home counties, but also in all 67 counties in this great Commonwealth. We make up the largest sector of higher education in Pennsylvania. If you would, please consider these 14, uh, these data points from the 14 community colleges. In 2017-18, almost 30%, over 86,000 of our students in the community college sector took at least one online course. That number continues to grow, and it seems as if it will grow at least by another 3% for this academic semester. In 2017-18 academic year, approximately 28% of credits earned in Pennsylvania Communities Colleges were taken online. Additionally, in the 18-19 academic year, we collectively offered 150 academic programs. I should emphasize that is without a student having to ever step foot onto one of our campuses. Now if you'd allow me for a second here to read the following. Data from the American Community Survey prepared for the Center for Rural Pennsylvania suggests that individuals in too many Pennsylvania counties still lack access and reliable broadband. 
The survey estimated that 15% of the residents in our home county of Butler County did not have internet access. That number was significantly higher in other counties in which we provide services to. For example, Clearfield and Jefferson counties where 27 and 26% of the households respectfully do not have broadband access. Now we have grown considerably since September of 1966. I've been president since 2007 and we've expanded throughout the northwestern uh, Pennsylvania region. While we are proud to be Butler County's community college, we also understand the Commonwealth's charge for institutions of higher education to go into underserved areas. With that said, we are an educational provider uh, uh, providing classes both on the credit and the non-credit side to over 20,000 individuals and that does include the important areas of public safety and EMS. We not only have our beautiful main campus in Butler Township and Butler County, we're also in Cranberry Township, Lawrence County, Mercer County, Jefferson County, and Armstrong County. And frankly, we have students from the majority of other counties in this Commonwealth. While our three-time number one ranked community college has uh, continued to expand services throughout the rural region, uh, we have students in those counties, in addition to Clarion, Clearfield, and Elk, which is attached to our BC3 at Brockway campus, who struggle with broadband internet access. I can tell you our students are very resilient. In order to compensate, they go to our campuses, like was mentioned earlier, and they utilize our computer labs. They utilize the wireless access in our cafes and in different locations at our college locations. However, our students, traditional age, not only go to our community colleges, but also work. You throw in our non-traditional population, they work, take classes, and juggle a family. It is my opinion that we're doing these, service, uh, these students a great disservice. While this model is doable, I believe that it prevents even more students from taking online, hybrid, or traditional classes. And speaking of traditional classes, I should note, don't think the technology is just needed for uh, internet or hybrid courses. Our traditional courses utilize the internet for research and other class assignments. A good number of our classes make use of audio, video, and streaming uh, multimedia through Blackboard, YouTube, Khan Academy, and textbook publishers supplemental websites. In order to do so, they need the connectivity that seems to be lacking. And there have been questions over the years. Fortunately, these questions are less and less about the integrity of distance education and online courses. To maintain that integrity, there are programs such as Respondus Lockdown Browser and Respondus Lockdown Browser with a monitor. That's basically video proctoring to make sure that the student who is registered for the class is in fact the student who is taking it. Folks, we're struggling with internet connection on laptops and computers. I can tell you that the millennials and the Gen Zers are now accessing their classes in the palm of their hand, and the problem's even more so magnified in doing so. In closing, I appreciate the opportunity to represent the 14 community colleges of the Commonwealth in this very important hearing. I applaud this committee for delving further into this very real problem, not only on behalf of our current students, but future students in the Commonwealth. So thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Newpower. Mr. Medvek. Good morning. I'm Jeff Medvek. I'm in charge of IT here at Penn State Fayette. Welcome to the campus. It's great having you, senators and representatives, here today. Um, one of my jobs here is working with students and their technology needs. Um, our students vary. You, have, you do have the haves and have-nots. Um, their hardware and software requirements um, sometimes it's really hard if they don't have communication and or connectivity at home to even offer them anything. They can use Word at home, but they can't necessarily use Word, submit the document, and actually get a grade on it. That's the piece where this infrastructure, with Senator Stefano's already mentioned, is so critical. Um, we have high-speed internet access here on campus ubiquitously. It's everywhere, but you go short distance. In fact, I've mentioned do a Google search not very far from it, there's no internet availability to me, which is crazy. It's only five minutes down the road. Um, 
location shouldn't be a reason that you're, you don't have internet access. Um, you've already talked about the socioeconomic uh, reasons. Um, it's, it's just incredible to me to think that this day and age, that we've been fighting this problem for probably 20 years, that if you do have internet, it's very slow or non-existent in rural areas. Um, we have uh, had students even run tests to say speeds can vary greatly, even within the same service. I'm not here to pick on providers, but even with the same provider, down the street, you may get a higher speed connection than you know a block over. And students know this. Uh, they know this because they play video games and realize their frame rates are dropping. You know, it's IT adjacent, but it's very important to them. That's something that uh, I'd like to see fixed. Um, as far as uh, you know, students here, you know. I've seen them use their cell phones to get on the internet at home. That's crazy. That speed is so slow, it almost causes them to work even harder to get to things, which shouldn't happen. Um, using your cell phone as a wireless access point, I say in the event of an emergency or something quick and easy maybe, but if that's your only solution at home, that's not really a solution. Um, access more specifically and Wi-Fi. Um, has been labeled by the Penn State Board of Trustees all the way back in two 2013. They labeled it as a common good. Um, that definition basically means it's like water, flushing toilets, electric to the buildings. We just have to have it everywhere all the time, 24-7. Um, in this building, I, I know where everyone's at, but um, we have you know dozens of wireless access points. Anywhere you're here, you're at least hit by probably three. So we know it you ever, won't go down. That's how important this is. When you get outside of here, that's where the failures begin. Um, as far as academic differences, we have students coming here who, without anything else, they have to do the work here. They're highly motivated at three o'clock in the morning to do internet, to do work sometimes, and I've been here maybe 15 to eight. They're waiting at the door to get in. Um, we are open to eight o'clock. I actually made a policy where the labs close at eight classrooms with computers in, I tell them, go over there, stay as long as you want. The police services will come through probably at 9 or 10, and they'll ask them to leave. And they do stay till 9 or 10 o'clock at night just to submit homework, again, which seems silly. If they don't have access at home, they have to do that. Um, jobs, family, you know, other things get in, uh, you know, get in the way. While they're here, if they treat it like a job, they have to do the work here. And again, you know, after a long day, being here at 8 o'clock at night, or 9 o'clock at night, is that going to be the best quality of work even, when you think about it? Um, we've had to, have to make arrangements for students as well, taking online courses. Um, as a Penn State student, you can take an online course from any other campus. University Park offers, you know, World Campus offers hundreds of them. If they don't have internet access at home, they've come to the service desk. We've done multiple solutions to help them. We've loaned them a laptop where they can, you know, audio, video, and everything right there. We've actually set up a classroom that was empty at the time and for a single student to go in and take an online course because they couldn't take the online course at home. The speed just wasn't there or there was no access. Again, Penn State tries to accommodate every request, but, but it's a case-by-case -case basis and it's a problem, I hate saying I shouldn't have to deal with at this day and age. Um, as far as uh, you know, the uh, Penn State outlook and how we're handling it, um, offering hardware, offering software is one solution making the ubiquitously available, here's another, giving testimony today to say, you guys get together and fix this problem. I was there when the first uh, hybrid modem came out for Helicon Cable 25 years ago, and you know we were getting blinding speed, which I don't even want to tell you what it was because it was very sad and pathetic. And you, you know, it, again, infrastructure needs to be built, and you guys need to kind of help us get there. Um, we want students to be successful, not just college-level students, K through 12. All that online learning, that's, that's really an investment in our future, and we can't skip that. We can't shortchange it. Um, again, thank you very much. Um, and again, Pat, I, I know you're alum here and everything. Thank you so much for hosting us, doing us here. I know that Dr. Patrick really appreciates every time that we host and do anything for it. And anything, anything Penn State can do to help these things, please just let us know. And I call you Pat only because I've known you since junior high. Thanks. Thank you very much, Mr. Medvek. Dr. Rosendahl, my apologies, I called you Nicholas, you are Eric, Dr. Eric Rosendahl, so if you could finish up our panel of testimony, we'd appreciate it. Thank you, Senator Phillips-Hill. Um, it is a great honor and privilege to be here, and um, you know, I, I think when I was first asked to do this, we were asked to tell our story of, uh, of 
how we got to where we are as intermediate units. So uh, rather than read the fact-filled six-page document that I submitted, um, I, I'll try to do my best to tell that story and to, and to summarize some of the more salient points for you uh, by you know, letting you know who we are, uh, what we do, how we got here, and perhaps some considerations uh, for moving forward. Uh, so intermediate units, there are 29 of us across the uh, Commonwealth, and we are you know, generally uh, referred to as uh, educational service agencies. Um, every year, intermediate units serve you know, hundreds of thousands of students, uh, adults, um, early education, and beyond. Um, and you know, one of the things that we really realize is that you know, in today's world, as we've heard from the other stories and testimonies today, uh, you know, technology plays a vital role in helping to educate our kids. And you know, intermediate units work with our districts to transform instruction to be more personalized. Uh, and that's not possible without broadband access in the school and in the community. Uh, I use in districts offer tens of thousands of students the option of taking online classes, again, mentioned by uh, the other colleagues here on the panel. And again, that is not possible without access both at school and at home. Um, and we work with our principals and our teachers to leverage you know, high quality digital resources uh, to enhance and transform instruction and the professional development. And again, not doable if it's not available both at school and at home. And so, you know, the, the intermediate unit story uh, is actually fairly remarkable in, in its transformation, um, you know, and, and, and fairly easy to, to trace. Uh, you know, if we go back to the primary mechanisms of what uh, got us to where we are, we could refer to the e-fund and to, to the E-rate programs. E-Fund was a state program uh, that started, um, you know, again, facts and figures are outlined in the uh, document, but I believe it was in 2004, 2005. Uh, and in, in that time, um, you know, we brought our school districts uh, from, you know, one and a half megs per second on average to, you know, well over uh, 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 you know, into, into the uh, 10 gig or, you know, one gig um, capacities. And there's a map on page four of the formal testimony that shows that remarkable, remarkable transition of the before and after the E-rate. Um, so PAIU net, what, what is PAIU net? So the, the network starts with the intermediate units who then uh, developed regional wide area networks through the E-rate program and the E-fund program. And those regional wide area networks connect the intermediate units to the school districts. And then the school districts connect out to their buildings. Uh, then in 2008, it was, I believe, that you know, intermediate units got together, the leaders, leadership got together and said, let's connect the IUs together so that now every school district can access every other school district, every other intermediate unit, and uh, peering services, which make available you know, uh, uh, educational resources and products uh, such as Google, Amazon, uh, Apple, uh, through what are called peering types of relationships. Uh, in addition, you know, PAI Unit has a special um, uh, relationship with our assessment vendor, DRC, uh, and, maintains, and DRC maintains a dedicated connection to PAI Unit and Pennsylvania is one of the only states in the country um, that, that has that type of a connection. And you know, that, that affords our students the ability to take their uh, assessments uh, without being interrupted uh, through you know, some faults of uh, public internet. <clears throat> um, and, and so you know, that's kind of who we are, uh, you know, a little bit of how we got here. Uh, but I would like to, to read a little bit about um, perhaps uh, uh, two concrete policy proposals um, that we'd like uh, you to consider. Um, and again, the formal testimony has it you know, uh, in more detail, but uh, it, the schools in certain geographic locations where it is cost prohibitive for schools to obtain fiber connectivity, as there continues to be no business case for service providers to invest in those areas. We as PAI Unit can help address this situation with a relatively small investment in state E-rate matching fund for new fiber projects. 24 states have set up such matching grants that leverage additional federal E-rate funds 
to reduce significantly the out-of-pocket costs for districts that take on fiber construction projects. The more fiber, you know, being built out to the schools, especially in those schools that don't have access, the more likely that fiber connections and higher speed internet can be accessible to the communities that surround those schools. Um, and then one final area uh, uh, for the committee's consideration uh, would be to resolve a conflict between E-rates uh, strict procurement rules and our own state's procurement laws. Um, so I'll, I'll read this piece to you also so that it's more clear. No other state has such a conflict. We respectfully request that the committee consider revising the procurement laws for Pennsylvania's public schools to allow them to consider other bid evaluation factors besides price for E-rate eligible technology equipment purchases or exempt schools from the state procurement rules if they are using the strict E-rate procurement rules for E-rate eligible technology equipment purchases. Not only would this simple legislative change help save money for Pennsylvania schools, it would put them on the same playing field as all other public schools in the country. Um, so once again, you know, greatly appreciative of the time to, to speak and participate in this panel and would be happy to answer questions today and going forward about any of these uh, topics. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Really appreciate your questions. Um, Dr. Rosendahl, if I, I could, um, my understanding is that the Federal Communications Commission is proposing an overall cap on the Universal Service Fund as well as a subcap on the E-rate and the rural health care program. So I agree with you that that E-rate program is vital in assisting our schools and our libraries to, to connect to high-speed broadband. Um, can you talk about any efforts that you're undertaking? I recently wrote to Chairman Pai and requested that he not place that subcap on the E-rate fund for the very reasons you stated. It, it has been an essential program to connect our schools. And, and I agree with um, your position that um, having that ability to fund you know, fiber to schools will help push it out um, to that last mile of homes in, in those school communities. You know, are you aware of, of what's been going on and, and have you and other school entities taken any action to advocate on behalf of maintaining that program? Uh, so yes, and not being the E-rate expert, as maybe I once was when I wore my technology director's cap uh, uh, working for an intermediate unit, um, you know, we, we do advocate. Um, uh, Julie Tritschell, she is our state E-rate coordinator, and she assists us uh, with our PAIU net projects, and she helps train our school districts uh, in, you know, the various uh, issues and, you know, laws and regulations with E-rate and helps them to, uh, you know, fully capitalize on that uh, uh, funding mechanism. Um, but as far as the, the, the cap issue, you know, I would have to research that and get back to you. And, and perhaps we could set up some time where we could meet with, you know, the committee and uh, uh, Julie Tritschell and, and go over some of those fine intricacies of the details, because it is very detail-oriented. Indeed it is, and I, I think that would be very helpful. I think for our school boards, for our IUs, um, that program has been really, really helpful in connectivity, and, and to have that subcap applied could be detrimental to what we're trying to do here in Pennsylvania. Um, I would like, thank you, Dr. Rosendahl. Very welcome. I'd like to recognize Senator Stefano. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Chairwoman, um, a couple questions. I'll start with uh, Mr. Seeley. You were, you were talking about your um, student access um, based on your subjective analysis. So how do we know if uh, people either, your, what percentage of your students actually do not have access or have access and can't afford it? How do we get a concrete number? Yeah, <clears throat> well, I, I'm not sure I have the answer to that. Um, but I would believe that all the superintendents for the school districts in at least Fayette County would be more than willing to uh, probably devise some sort of um, questionnaire that could go out to the students' homes uh, to find out, for, number one, do you have access? 
And then number two, uh, is it high speed internet? I, I, I believe that you, you can't, you can't uh, just rely on students coming forward. They're, they're just not going to do it at that age. So you have to do it in a different way to get what I think you would like to know. That's what I'm looking for, some concrete numbers. It helps us to know right. exactly what right. mountain we have to fight. Right. Um, yeah. But as an antidote, I said, I assume you won't send that survey out online then, right? <laughs> yeah, that's correct, yes. <laughs> uh, in the sake of time, we'll move on. Thank you for your answer. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Allison, um, you, you mentioned that you have a lot of students that apply or, or commute and use on, um, online access yes. to, to. Do you have a percentage there of the number of students you're, you're seeing that have difficulty with that? type of broadband access, do you know how many have not been able to apply? And then how many are commuting that have access difficulties? Do you have any gauge? I'm, again, I'm looking for solid numbers. Well, I don't have those numbers here. Uh, it, it wouldn't be hard to develop numbers based on um, applications and, and locations and compare that with, I'm sure, data that we can get from providers on coverage and, and uh, you know, in density. So uh, I think those numbers could be developed. It would take a little bit of effort, but not, it's not impossible. Again, same, uh, the more concrete evidence we have, yeah. the more we have the ability to justify the fight we're fighting. Yep. And last question, this is for Dr. Rosendale. Um, I'm fascinated with this uh, wide area network that you've uh, put together and connected all the schools. Uh, what type of system did you put that network on? I'm you know, trying to learn this process. So what kind of backbone do you have and how did you get all these schools connected? So the, the process um, uh, started with the regional wide area networks in the uh, intermediate unit regional territories and reaching out to the school districts. And you know, th they were built on the, the technology, um, uh, mixed technology. Um, you know, not having exact details, I'll speak to Beaver County. Um, Beaver County went from every school district having a T1 line, uh, paying, you know, about $1,000 a month for one and a half meg service to having a gigabit uh, fiber connection. Uh, and through that gigabit fiber connection, we were able to pool uh, our resources and buy internet in bulk, and we reduced our cost um, significantly again don't have the exact numbers but you know so that was that was what we were able to manage in Beaver County uh, other solutions in other parts of the state you know required different creativity types of measures uh, so at the very beginning they would have been mixed solutions um, you know uh, some perhaps even using wireless technologies uh, but more and more they're becoming you know fiber and with the e-rates um, ability now to allow for purchase of dark fiber. Uh, some intermediate units and in, uh, regions have even gone that route and are, you know, taking on that next level of the initiative. All right, thank you for your answer. I was, I was trying to determine how much of uh, that network was fiber. Yeah, and that should be something that I'm going to write these questions down. And that should be something that we should be able to work to get to you. All right, thank you. Thank you, Senator Stefano. Senator Costa. Well, thank you very much, and thank each of you for your testimony. Just a quick question as I'm sitting here thinking, um, there are a universe of folks who, um, who in their region may have broadband available to them, but for whatever reason are unable to afford it. Are there any programs that the schools offer to assist them financially to be able to, be able to connect with a, a uh, provider? Um, do the providers have programs that they work with you specifically for those students that but for um, having access and affording access uh, can take these courses, whether it be at the secondary level or at the high rate level. I'm just curious if there are any programs or any partnerships that have been developed for those individuals who cannot p p afford access that's limiting their ability to, to, to earn a degree or, or even do work in high school. Anyone who wants to take a chance at that? Thank you for the question. We have a great partnership with Armstrong Cable, which uh, has a, a history in Butler County, has literally expanded throughout Pennsylvania into other states. And uh, they were a major investor into our Heaton Family Learning Commons, which is a 21st century library. So we went from the library model to an information 
uh, commons type model that has all the bells and whistles for technology that allows our students to link and connect uh, to uh, uh, our other campuses. Great example, and, and you know, I'm speaking on behalf of the 14 community colleges, but there are a fair share of our students who are taking online courses from BC3 and are enrolled in State System Universities, Penn State, Pitt. We have a great connection uh, with Clarion University in accounting made possible by that Armstrong donation in our learning commons uh, in a two plus two agreement to connect our students in accounting to Clarion University's bachelor's degree in accounting and they do so because of that technology with the investment that Armstrong made. So our investment would be more into our uh, campuses as opposed to following the student at their individual homes. That's what I was trying to get to. Are we able to provide resources following them to their home to be able to do that? I know I serve as treasurer for our community college in Allegheny County and I can tell you um, our, our technology fees consistently go up for credit every year because of the advancements that are taking place but but we don't do a whole lot in the space of making certain that students who cannot afford it have access to it. I know our library systems for example in Pittsburgh have been providing you know um, iPads and also um, those little blocks I'm not sure what the right term is uh, to allow people to have access along those lines to support along so I was thinking something along those lines might be something that we should consider and maybe you fold it into your technology fee I don't know but mm -hmm. that's something we should consider um, well Brownsville did not do <coughs> does not have the rear did not does not at this point had the resources I know Connellsville School District uh, we went and visited them a team from Brownsville and um, they provide, I believe, this is accurate, they provide a laptop to all their high school students. What I don't know is how that relates in, in relevant to actually high-speed internet following them to their homes. But I, I do know that they uh, do provide the, the uh, that. Okay. Two other comments I'll make. Uh, Comcast, I'm familiar with, in, at least in our area, has uh, Internet Essentials, where um, you know subscribers can uh, you know uh, pay for a reduced cost internet connectivity, and then um, also through the interstate telecommunications revenues that are assessed through our you know uh, universal service fees. Um, you know that's bro broken down into four components. We spoke of one, which is the e-rate portion. Um, but there is another program under that um, for, for low income uh, called Lifeline, I believe is the name of it. And, you know, uh, directly to consumers, they can qualify for cell phone and Internet access. I appreciate that. And I think that's what I'm trying to get to. To what degree are we coordinating those programs with our students? If we can work towards that end, I think that would be very helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Costa. Representative Warner. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank everybody for their testimony here today. I was going to highlight uh, exactly what Senator Costa just mentioned. To me, this seems like a twofold problem, and one is not just access, but the other is affordability. Uh, broadband is expensive. In fact, just going over my monthly budget at home, uh, we debated whether to cut broadband and to use cell phone Wi-Fi, what you just mentioned. Um, doesn't seem like it's a good idea now. But um, no, that was a serious discussion because it is. It's very it's expensive, right? Um, you know, <clears throat> and to me, what I'm hearing from the testimony is it's a little concerning because uh, even with access to broadband, it seems to me that affordability can still be a major issue. Um, that some of these people may already have access, but affordability could currently be an issue. Um, I think it was said, what was it, 27% of some homes in, I think, Jefferson County may not have, it's like one, but just roughly, you say one in four children do, doesn't have access to broadband. Um, my only concern is, and we've mentioned we heard about children and their parents being in parking lots to do homework. Are we putting the cart before the horse here and pushing uh, requirements for internet homework. I say more so in the in the high schools. I understand that it's still challenges in the community colleges, but my concern is in the schools. Are we putting 
people in disadvantaged communities at a greater disadvantage by having requirements that, that homework and lesson plans that require broadband. Um, not to say that we shouldn't be pushing for broadband expansion and affordability, but I'm a little concerned that are we right now putting disadvantaged children at a bigger disadvantage by pushing this uh, when, you know, I, I don't, I mean, what type of, what type of scholastic work is done or required that, that, that would require broadband? I mean, what are these, a kid that doesn't have broadband access, what kind of disadvantage are they at right now? I believe they're at a great disadvantage <laughs> and um, so let me just stop if, you we, one if we're going to uh, resolve this issue uh, and have all Pennsylvanians um, have broadband uh, if they don't have it now you, your, your concern is that um, we may be putting them in an unfortunate situation the opposite of that if we don't do something as a Commonwealth to address this situation now, the Commonwealth and our nation are going to have difficulty in competing in this global market. We have to resolve this situation. Yeah, so I guess just, uh, and I'll finish up here for sake of time. Uh, I guess maybe in the future, if I could, I would just like to know like what type of requirements uh, or what type of, um, education requirements are, 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 are used for broadband? Like what are these kids expected to use for broad in their curriculum? Um, again, it is just, this is just a considering that children are in parking lots and doing homework. I'm just concerned, especially because the people that don't have access to it are already from disadvantaged communities and probably from lower socioeconomic statuses, okay? So that, this is just my concern is that I understand the school's pushing it, so this is kind of like a chicken and egg thing. If we don't push it, we won't have it. I, I understand that, but I'm just wondering, are schools pushing this too much right now and putting kids in disadvantaged communities at a bigger disadvantage? I'm just concerned, are we pushing, we have to have broadband because it's the, you know, uh, it, it's the next phase of education before we're actually ready for the next phase of education. Uh, I mean, it's no point in pushing or using educate broadband education if not all kids have access to it. I just don't think it's fair to the kids that can't afford it or have access to it. Uh, again, it is it is not just an access issue. What I'm seeing here, it's also an affordability issue. I mean, broadband is is, is not cheap, uh, and I'm happy to hear about the programs. And that's why you know, I was going to lead off with what Senator Costa said. If we're able to get this to other to to 100% access. Uh, I think that we also have to keep in mind all of us here at this table is to make sure that everybody can still afford it and get it because if not, it's pointless just to provide it. If not, everybody still has access to it. And I don't think it's fair education uh, to push for it when everybody does not have access. You're, you're splitting, I mean, again, 27% of, of households in, in, in one county, 25% other don't have access to it. And we're pushing educational curriculum that requires broadband access. Uh, to me, it's just, it's just, it, it, it's troubling. Um, I, I'm just wondering if maybe the schools need to look at that a little bit, what the curriculum is, pushing it before we're quite ready to get there. And uh, again, thank you guys very much. I appreciate your testimony here today. Could thank I you, answer? Representative Sorry. Warner. Um, Mr. Medvek, if you Can would like back? to respond. To your original, uh, yes, there are economic reasons, and I totally get that. Um, when you say what's, you know, available students, what's required, um, at the college level, just about everything, whether it's their book to read, you know, any time, day or night, whether it's the homework assignment, whether it's the questions at the end, whether it's an interaction with, with uh, faculty members. We have the ability right now, they do Zoom meetings where we have a classroom and after hours, you know, between seven and eight, the math teacher will be available. How do I do this problem? They can remote in, share information, interact with the student online. Um, that requires higher speed access. Now, just to you know, uh, play a simple video, yeah, it's, it's, it takes a little more, but the interaction, the connectivity we're talking about, it's everything involved. About two or three years ago, I believe it was um, one of the vice presidents of information uh, systems came here, and he said Penn State's committed. He held up a cell phone. All students should be able to do everything, at least have it available on a cell phone. Now, I've seen students in the hallway typing a paper on a cell phone. I don't recommend it. I mean, it's a crazy thing to do. But if that's the only way they can you know, get assignments submitted, they'll find a way, and students are very creative, trust me. 
Um, they want to use stuff online. They don't want to carry a big, heavy book. In fact, in some ways, they save money by getting an online book instead of paying, you know, I'm not supposed to put down books here. I love books, but they're expensive. And if they can have it online, cheaper, they don't have to sell it back. I, they electronically get it for a semester. They take the course. They do everything for the class. And then it just disappears at the end of the semester because it's, you know, it's time limited. Problem solved, and they save money. So, but without the access to see the book, that hurts them big time. Um, just last week, I was at a faculty member uh, playing videos. I think there was a dozen uh, YouTube videos that, that he wanted students to view from Tuesday to Thursday. Well, again, if you can do it here in the labs or if you're at home at 2 o'clock in the morning when students are highly motivated, that's when they want to see this stuff. And that's where, you know, you, to say it's just an economic reason that we're somehow shortchanged, that push to be paperless and whatnot has been going on for years. And I'd like to see with our sustainability movement here even, they want to get rid of printers. They, want, they don't want you to have physical test books. Everything electronically saves money, gets it out to the students more, is available 24-7, and that creates more opportunity for the students. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you there. And I do agree the economics is a concern too, because I think I pay way too much for internet at home too, but I'm an IT guy. Mr. Allison. Uh, it's also worth noting in, in this conversation that uh, the job market, the professions, society, all of those are 100% are entrenched in, in this, this uh, high speed, high volume world. Uh, the skills that are needed by the, the college students and then going down the line, the skills needed by the K through 12 uh, are, are ingrained in that, in that broadband world. Have, developing the critical thinking skills where you go out and you do the research and you download the various videos and documents and things that have been compiled on the internet, you know, that activity is where you grow and learn so that you can come out and actually compete with all the other students and all the other, you know, prospective employees that are out there uh, that you won't compete against if you sit down and you don't know how to do that and do it quickly and do it well. Uh, so it's not really education putting something in front of the students before the market is ready. It's really the market saying, look, we need people that can do this. Can higher ed provide it? Okay, so if higher ed can provide it, who are the students that are, that are going to succeed in higher ed? They're the ones that came out of K through 12 that also had that capability. Uh, so I, you know, I look at my 12-year-old son, and he's at a disadvantage if I don't allow him enough access and enough skills and enough capability in that world. I also try to keep him away from things you know, on the internet. Um, and, and there's a competition there, and it's very clear that, that he has to keep up, and how can all of them keep up uh, and meet that job need? So it's really driven by where the world already is. Thank you. I would, I, I would mention something to consider from a capital investment perspective from a state level. Community colleges pop up in the mid-1960s. We are, much, much like this president, 52, 53, you know, 55 years old. Uh, we have deferred maintenance like you cannot believe. And we go through the Pennsylvania Department of Education through a great process for capital uh, investment into our community colleges. Frankly, our master plan is calling for less buildings, which would mean less deferred maintenance, which would mean less money and requests to the Commonwealth for funding. And it would be my guess, certainly not an expert like my uh, colleagues here, but if there would be perhaps an investment that would go along these lines, from what would be asked for from the capital pool from PDE for the deferred maintenance on one hand, and you look at the investment in this infrastructure in another, it might be interesting, and my guess is, is that uh, it would probably benefit the Commonwealth in terms of dollars uh, for that type of investment. Thank you for the question. Senator Costa. Just very brief on that point, because I'm familiar with the um, community college capital line item, and our, to what degree is broadband expansion on a college campus permitted from that line item? Or, or, or are you able to do much of that? Because I know we increase our tech. We're doing about you know six million bucks over the next couple this this year and a couple more years in just technology to bring it up to speed. Are you saying that you cannot use that capital pot from the 14 colleges for infrastructure-based needs as as a project? or as your top project for that college? Uh, I, my understanding of the capital process, of course, is uh, purchase, leases, 
And, right. Uh, I, yes, and I am I'm, okay. I'm, uh, not quite sure that it allows for uh, that as a possibility. Broader, broader build out. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Thanks. Dr. Rosendale. If I, if I may, I, I think that's the power of why we're here today. Um, intermediate units, <clears throat> excuse me, through PAI unit, uh, through its collective action, you know, we were able to bring uh, internet speeds down uh, or costs down by 79%. Um, I know it's a very complex world that we live in, broadband and telecommunications, et cetera, but if we can simplify mechanisms like we were just discussed and come together and join forces, you know, what are the K-12 schools building in combination with what are the needs of the colleges? And if we could work together and remove some of the barriers like the, uh, you know, the E-rate the e and state procurement rules, uh, you know, surrounding those types of issues, I think the dollars could be leveraged and be used more effectively to drive costs down, to make it more affordable, to make it more accessible. Thank you very much. Representative Snyder. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I will be brief, and that's exactly where I wanted to go. Explain to me exactly what the conflict is in the procurement laws between E-rate and the state so that we know what we need to fix. So that information is in the written testimony. Would you like me to, to read it here? It or is all in there. It, okay. All right, the, perfect. The, the, the basics of it are in there and the outline of it is in there. But again, if we want to have more specific conversations, we're certainly happy to set those meeting times and dates up and Perfect. have the experts in the room. Thank you very much. We would appreciate that going forward. Thank you very much, Representative Snyder. And, and thank you to my colleagues. Great questions, great interaction with the panel. And, and I will say that educational equity is limited by a lack of access. And, and I think that has point has been driven home here today. And, and with regard to pricing, I can tell you that Penn State University is conducting the first, perhaps even nationwide study of pricing of internet because there are great discrepancies and we do find that um, more rural areas are paying significantly more for commensurate service that urban and suburban areas are receiving. So stay tuned, that research will be coming out of Penn State University. So gentlemen, I thank you very much for your testimony today. And we will now be moving on to our second panel, which is going to focus on agriculture. And joining us here today for this part of our discussion are Wayne Campbell, president of the Pennsylvania Grange, Mr. Michael Lynch, Pennsylvania Farm Bureau, Mr. William Voigt, general field representative for broadband in the U.S. Department of Agriculture, Mr. Darren Euchre, Director of State Government Affairs for Pennsylvania Farm Bureau, and Mr. Mark Kritz, Western Regional Director and the Executive Director of the Rural Development Council. And I thank you all for joining us here today. And again, um, please, if you could summarize your opening remarks as much as possible, because uh, we're going to have a lot of questions for you, I am certain. So if we could start with Mr. Campbell. Thank you. The milk was delicious. Now, I will tell you, almost as good as what you can get in York County. <laughs> almost as good, but, but very much appreciated. So Mr. Campbell. There we go. Thank you, Senator Phillips Hill. And I would like to thank all the uh, senators and representatives for the opportunity to be here today and for the Penn State uh, Fayette campus for, for hosting this. And I will not read the um, prepared statement that you have before you. I will go through and kind of highlight some of the things and tell you some uh, stories from my life that kind of relate to broadband and, and what we're facing today. And starting out, you'll see in the very beginning there, it talks about how the Pennsylvania, or how the, the Grange was very instrumental uh, in the 20th century on the develop of rural electric co-ops and getting electricity out into the countryside. 
And we feel that this is the 21st century of rural electrification. And it's going to take a partnership of everyone working together in order to uh, accomplish this goal. If, if you go through to the first uh, point that we have there, it talks about education. And uh, Representative Warner, I'd, I'd like to address the question that you asked about, are we getting the uh, chicken before the egg or, or you know, the horse before the, the cart? And in here, uh, we talk about Senator Phillips Hill at the first meeting that the Pennsylvania Grange ever attended with her of what got her interested in this and, and what she said earlier about students having to go to school and, and use the school's Wi-Fi. Where I live, my grandchildren and my daughter and son-in-law live about 150 feet away from us. When she found out she was pregnant with twins, it was like, Dad, you have some place right there where we can build. And so we made that happen. My daughter is a special needs teacher. And of course, she had twins, boy and girl. They're now 14 years old. And when they come home at night, their homework is on a tablet. We are fortunate that we have internet DSL. Problem is, you never know when you're gonna have it. You might be doing your homework and all of a sudden it drops out. Might be 15 minutes later, might be an hour later. Now I'm gonna, back when we get into um, community development, I'm gonna bring up the same thing and tell you a story uh, with, with that. But I'll go back to many, many years ago whenever I was still in high school and I had to take a typing class. And I said to the teacher, what do I need typing for? I'm gonna be milking cows all my life. Well, as president of the Pennsylvania State Grange, I'm no longer milking cows. I actually got out of the dairy business in 1981. And all of a sudden, what, do I, what am I on every day of the week? A keyboard. It's, it's now a part of my life. And I'll go back to whenever I was in school in the 70s and, and prior to that, we did our research with encyclopedias. How many of you have seen an encyclopedia salesman in the last 20 years? So that's basically what we're saying is if a school doesn't have internet, if it doesn't have access to broadband, we're asking our students to do their homework with a set of encyclopedias when the school 10 miles down the road is doing it on the internet. And when they're researching, researching physics, we're just trying to find P in the encyclopedia. So I, I don't believe that gives us, you know, everybody a fair and equal playing field. The, the next uh, topic that we talked about was commerce in our presentation. And with, with commerce, what business is going to locate in rural America or rural Pennsylvania if they can't use the internet? And, and I'm gonna use an example here that I, I actually uh, said to, I think it was re either Representative Snyder or Senator Hill out in the hallway, the butcher shop that my wife and I buy our meats at is very close to our home. And I was in there one Saturday to pick up some meat and the, the owner's daughter ran my credit card. And as soon as she swiped the card, I saw the look on her face change. And I said, Ann, what's wrong? Well, we just lost internet. She said, for you, it's not a problem. I know you, I know your card's good. But she said, what do I do if somebody's passing through and they stop and they buy, they, they pick up $200 worth of meat and I go to swipe their card and we lose internet? Do I let them walk out the door with $200 worth of product? or do I lose the sale on $200 worth of product? What's the right thing to do? So that's, that's what we're looking at in you know, rural America for commerce. What company is going to want to come in and do business in rural America if they, if they can't connect? Um, campgrounds associations, especially along the northern tier of Pennsylvania, many of them, their members are, are, Pens are members of the Pennsylvania State Grange and they can't get people to come to their campgrounds anymore because the first question they ask, it used to be, do you have full hookup? 
which meant do you have water, sewage, and electricity? Now the first question is, do you have Wi-Fi? And if the campground says no, click, they hear a hang up, and they're, they're moving on down the road. So it, it, it's very, very critical to rural, America, or rural Pennsylvania's development to have, and I'll refer, I refer to it as adequate broadband. In farming, uh, Representative Snyder at, at the uh, hearing that I, I spoke at in Harrisburg, after it was over, one of the other representatives comes up to me and when I started talking about smart farming and how it can reduce the amount of runoff and the expense to farmers on fertilizer, herbicides and that type of thing, he said, Wayne, he said, I actually have a friend that bought a smart corn planter and he said in one year, he saved over $3,000 in seed corn. Imagine what $3,000 in the pocket of a dairy farmer today means. Because yesterday I was at the milk marketing uh, board hearing on over premium price and every dairy farmer talks about income over feed costs, expenses. One gentleman that testified yesterday talked anywhere from five to eight, ten dollars income over feed costs per hundredweight. That doesn't mean much to the average individual, but basically you're not, they can't even pay their bills at that. If you can save $3,000 by on one piece of equipment, by utilizing one piece of equipment, imagine what you can do if you can utilize that technology on your sprayer, on your combine, on your tractor, you know, because they, they can record the amount of bushels per acre as that combine's going through the field. They can monitor where there's poor weed kill, monitor where there's poor yield, and next year, in the winter time by utilizing a program that they'll get over the internet. Next year when that sprayer goes through the field, they can increase herbicide, they can decrease herbicide, they can increase fertilizer, decrease her fertilizer. Less runoff, less expense. Without broadband, it's just another combine going out through the field. Doesn't matter if it's green, red, or um, yeah, blue. Well, I guess blue nowadays. I'm, I'm used to the days of when New Holland was still red and yellow. But, you know, so from a farming aspect, um, in, in your uh, presentation that I gave to you, I do want to bring up one thing. And this from, was from the uh, NAS study, the National Agricultural Statistics Service. It says, in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, farms with Internet access in Pennsylvania increased to 64% in 2019 compared to 62% reported in 2017 according to King Whetstone, director of USDA's Na National Agricultural Statistics Service. So that means in two years, we increased 2%. So think about it. We only have 26 more years to go, and we'll be at 100%. Is that adequate? I don't think so. Not if we want Pennsylvania's number one industry to stay number one. If you go on to health, and it talks about telemedicine, uh, again, Senator Phillips Hill and Representative Snyder, you've heard this story, but I used to work for Prairie County Transportation before I came, became president of the Pennsylvania State Grange. I had a gentleman in western Prairie County that had a severe stroke. He lived by himself. He was in an area with no internet service. I mean, he was way back off the beaten path. When I would pick him up at six o'clock in the morning to take him to a doctor's appointment in Camp Hill that might be scheduled for 8, 30, 9 o'clock, he was literally on that bus for two, two and a half hours to get from Western Prairie County to Camp Hill. I don't know about you folks, but very seldom any time I've ever gone to a doctor, do you spend more than 10, 12 minutes in the doctor's office and he's gone. That gentleman after the doctor's appointment would sit in the waiting room and wait anywhere from 15 minutes to sometimes an hour for a shared transportation ride to come back and pick him up. Then he'd be looking at another anywhere from an hour and a half to three hours to get back to Western Prairie County depending on how many stops there were between Camp Hill and where he lived. So that man to spend 10, 12 minutes, 15 maybe in a doctor's office would spend six to eight hours in transit. With telemedicine, 
he could have done that visit over the computer in the 10 to 12 minutes and not be totally worn out. There were times when I would get him home that I would literally walk him to the door to make sure that he didn't stumble and fall, that he was that worn out. We're short servicing our, our, the residents and particularly the seniors of our communities because of the uh, inavailable of uh, telemedicine. And at, at the conclusion, I, I think I've given you some examples here today of where we really fall short. Um, I'm going to stir the pot a little bit and everybody here has been giving you, here's what the problem is. You all know what the problem is. How do we fix it? And it boils down to, it doesn't matter where you're at, it boils down to money. How do we fix it? The governor has proposed a four and a half billion dollar tax on Marcellus Shale to fund this. But when you look in the initiative, there's eight, 10, 11 other items that that four and a half billion dollars is divided out into. What happens if we go that route and two years from now, the Department of Environmental Protection says we can no longer drill for Marshallis Shale because it's contaminating all this water or it's doing this. Now we've borrowed four and a half billion dollars and the question is, and particularly the gentleman beside me, I believe, will, you know, it will verify if you're a farmer, you know you don't overborrow. And how do we pay it back? Pennsylvania State Grange, at a meeting that was con convened at the farm show last year, one of the presenters at that suggested a, a surtax on cell phones. Each cell phone would pay a certain amount of tax. And right away, someone said, people in Philadelphia and Pittsburgh will never go for that. My thought is this. Every time for me to get here today, I had to travel the turn. I didn't have to, but I chose to travel the turnpike. Part of my fee is going to go to SEPTA in Philadelphia. When my taxes help build at least one sports arena in Philadelphia. I think that they can help support rural America to get broadband because even Philadelphia has dead spots in it. And if somebody from Philadelphia goes to New York to visit a relative or on business and they're traveling out Route 6 in Northern Pennsylvania and they have a heart attack or they come across the scene of an accident and they can't use their cell phone to call for help, all of a sudden was that surcharge worth it? Whether it's 50 cents, 75, a dollar, you know, if, if you, earlier we talked about the dairy industry. If you talk to any dairy farmer in Pennsylvania, they totally understand surcharge. They get a surcharge for fuel, they get a surcharge for dairy promotion, and it's not a voluntary thing. When they get their milk check, it's already taken off. It's not something that, no, I don't want to pay it this month, but next month I made an extra $100 on the milk check, I'll pay it next month. It's automatic. And, and so, you know, we really need to look at how can we fund this and how can we make it happen? You know, it, it, it's time that we start to move forward and actually get boots on the ground. Uh, in April, I was with the National Grange down in uh, Washington, D.C. at what they refer to as our national fly-in where we go to visit our, our representatives and Congress people down there. We actually had a meeting with the FCC and at the end of April, they admitted to us that their plan or their, um, what the program that they said everybody had internet on was totally wrong. And Penn State can be thanked for being able to prove them that that was wrong. What they were doing was using the theory that if any person in a, in a census block had the ability to get high speed internet, then everybody in that census block had high-speed internet. So it made it look like Pennsylvania was very well covered with high-speed internet. Penn State has proved that wrong. And in April, at that meeting that we were at, FCC admitted, we're wrong. We're, we're working now to correct our, our data. Um, Betsy Huber, our, our national president, was the only agricultural representative on an FCC advisory board on broadband. 
and that board's term has expired. But one thing that came out of that was the recommendation for uniform codes on companies running wires. Because right now, if, if Verizon wants to go through three towns, they have to submit three plans. Each one of those plans is going to cost how many hundreds of thousands of dollars? If there was uniform codes that they could submit one plan and go through those three towns, that additional money could be wire, wire in the ground, wire on a pole, maybe another cell tower or whatever. But we need to, to get things uniform that we're not spending money two and three times. And then also the, the rural electrification. Uh, there was in Huntington County, there's actually a co-op established their own ISP for an area of Huntington County. And I just found out before the meeting convened this morning that I believe there's another one being started in Center County right now. So uh, again, we're moving forward, but we'll get there. And thank you for the opportunity to be here. I indeed we are. Thank you very much, Mr. Campbell. Mr. Lynch. All right, thank you. Um, so my name is Michael Lynch. I'm a maple producer out of Somerset County, Pennsylvania. Um, I know Pat a little bit. He probably understands I'd rather be sitting in a field or a woods right now. Uh, probably should have put me first because I'm going to be a lot shorter and more to the point. Uh, mine is more of a utilization of um, what's going in our industry of agriculture. Uh, my wife Sharon and I both went to Penn State. I was a dairy farmer. Now I'm a maple farmer. Um, we still raise cattle, uh, run equipment, raise crops. Um, also, if I don't have enough to do, I'm also a salesman and technician for CDL USA, a, a Canadian and United States company that specializes in maple equipment with over 40 plus million in sales in the North America. So that's uh, a little bit of my background. Um, tapping maple trees, you look at my bio, Everybody thinks of buckets and wooden fires, et cetera. And in northern PA and western PA, you know, we've got big pockets of maple syrup. Um, that's not the case anymore. Um, it's like thinking of anything in agriculture. Uh, we've moved way beyond that. Uh, you see miles of lines hanging in the woods if you're from my area. Um, you go to Vermont, you know, the gold capital of maple, the world as they call it. Uh, I'm not sure. It's western Pennsylvania. but. Uh, it's a different world. We don't walk through the woods and gather buckets. We're relying on technology. We're using electricity for reverse osmosis. We're using collection tanks. We're marketing our products worldwide, uh, not just out of a little corner store anymore. So things have changed. Um, and we're behind the times down here. I'll admit to that, uh, slowly catching up to, uh, to Canada and some of the northern states. But we use technology in different ways, and it all relies on the internet. Um, much as the other ag uses GPS for farming, we're actually using it to collect data. So maple syrup in itself is a time-sensitive situation. It's like planting your spring crop in the garden or on your farm. You've got this much time. Uh, we might have two weeks. We might have two months to make maple syrup in a year. We might plan for 12 months to take care of two months of the year. So we need technology to make us get the most bang for our buck, per se, in, in our woods. Uh, the lines you see in the woods uh, have vacuum systems hooked to them. We have tanks that can overflow, um, all needs collected. What we've done is, as my job in the maple world is, I work with smart production technology. We call it a wise mesh system. We actually co put computer systems in the woods, on lines, tank levels, uh, equipment that's remotely operated. Um, that stuff all ties its own system, but it's got to be hooked, and it has to be, um, it cannot be just uh, an internet connection that's Bluetooth or uh, Wi-Fi is what I was looking for. We have to be hardwired into a good system um, for our technology to work. When I go to visit a customer to sell a system such as I'm talking about that will increase their production uh, as them monitoring, let's say that they had a problem in the woods, a tree fell and broke a line, or a tank 
is running over and the prophet's running down the stream. I got to sell them on the idea they got to have internet first. My system doesn't do any good if it doesn't have an internet connection. Uh, one of those reasons is uh, my company updates the data all the time. It's much like being on Google or any other system. Everything is updated continuously. The second is uh, we cloud our information. Third is we rely on it for notifications. Um, I have one of these systems in my woods, and uh, I also manage other systems for other people. Um, the place in Rockwood, I run a secondary sugar operation. 15 miles away, 25 minute drive. That system at that location will actually notify me when my tank is 75% full of sap to process by my cell phone or an internet connection to an email. That's what I'm trying to sell to producers, um, saving them time and knowing what's going on. So if they don't have that hookup, we're in trouble. The funny thing is uh, we rely on cell service a lot for that now. Uh, I got Wi-Fi boxes all over the place. We're building Wi-Fi boxes on top of the mountains with solar panels and batteries that, you know, we hope works for two months of the year. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. So those systems are completely tied to that. Um, and because it's like anything else, we can't go back. Yeah, I can make maple syrup without technology. <laughs> I can do it old school. I don't have to have this. However, I don't have a single customer that would go backwards once I give them the system. Uh, two o'clock in the morning, many times I get a text from a producer in Ohio or West Virginia that says, hey, my system, the cloud just went on offline from CDL USA. They didn't have a broadband problem, but if they didn't have the broadband to tell them that, where some of my customers locally don't, um, I wouldn't know that there is any problems. Um, beyond that, um, we, we've experienced this in not just Somerset County that I deal with. Um, I, I get called to work on these systems, uh, Tioga Potter, uh, Northern Tier States, which we know is very rural as well. I mean, you consider Somerset pretty populated until you go up to Wellsboro and north. Um, so, so we do need that, that system. Beyond that, um, our own personal sales um, between my business and the business I work for, we sell maple syrup from here to, well, basically around the world, but our huge market is Annapolis, Baltimore, North Carolina. 20% of my sales have come from social media platforms where people have picked up our data. When they walk into my store, much as we talked earlier about him in the meat market, it, the days of cash are gone. <laughs> so I rely on somebody swiping a credit card. And again, I'm the guy that stands there at the farm market going, boy, I hope this thing will take your money <laughs> so I can have it. Um, the other thing is my, my main job at CDL I rely on a remote internet connection for my laptop and computer to their central server. So if a customer wants through the door and wants to buy a $10,000 shiny piece of stainless steel equipment, our, our, it would be similar to Walmart. Prices change every day. Well, that's what we are. I log on to the internet. I see what the price is today. Um, I sell it. I don't sell it, et cetera. But I rely on that internet. Uh, inventory control, et cetera. So the connection means a lot to us. Um, funny thing is it's only going to get worse. It's like anything else. Uh, you know, I started at Penn State with before dial-up with the first email account I ever had. Um, I went to Canada this year to watch a sugar operation at my uh, one of my bosses, the owners of the company. We actually went to a sugar operation that we call a uh, Sugar Bush 5.0. Everything is completely computer generated. They hit their phone from home, a reverse osmosis kicks on. You're used to reverse osmosis for drinking water. We use it to concentrate sap before we cook it to save time and money. It's all done remote. We went through a major upgrade this winter on our systems 
past winter because that technology to run that equipment has to be instantaneous. It would be like uh, changing a light signal in an intersection. Everything's got to be coordinated. If both directions are going green, we're going to have a train wreck. This, com this system now, we rely on fast internet to touch a button. My customer in Wellersburg better know that a switch flipped right then or his profits went down the drain for the day unless he physically drives there. Um, these computer technologies in Canada I watched, we turned the equipment on from Vermont. 600 miles away the equipment was operating by itself. And it's uh, unfortunate in some ways that that's what the future is and that's where it's going. So thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Mr. Lynch. Mr. Voigt. Hello, my name's Bill Vogt. I'm the USDA Rural Development, Rural Utilities Services, Telecommunications Programs General Field Representative. I serve a multiple state area, and I've got a great job I want to tell you about. I get to work with people in a government lending and grant program and provide federal funds for broadband on a technical technology neutral basis. I get to work with them in the application process and the construction process and then also see the end result of what's happening. And that's a great place to be. To see the end result oftentimes doesn't happen in government. Oftentimes it's just processing a part of the pie but not seeing the whole thing. And I get to see the end results. Before I tell you about the applications and the processes I'd like to tell you a little bit about end results that I see as I travel around multiple states. I was in one state and saw some completed broadband facilities and the local people said the school superintendent wants to see you. A story we heard during the uh, previous group. The school superintendent sought me out to tell me thank you for what the federal government has done in providing funding in this area because the school superintendent said this School year, it's the first time ever in the entire school district that we can assign internet-based homework because every home in the area has the access to internet. And he said, you don't maybe understand what that means to me, but that's the biggest thing to me because prior to now, we could not do that. We could not have any internet-based assignments because some of the households were not equipped. Now they're all equipped or to go out in another location, and I was having um, lunch with the administrator of a hospital, and he looked out on the sidewalk, and he said, see the man walking down the sidewalk? A while back, that man was having a stroke. He came in the hospital, and because of teleradiology equipment we have installed over broadband facilities, we were able to treat him here, and if you would talk to him, he would tell you he's convinced he would have died that day in a 100-mile ambulance trip to the nearest facility because otherwise they would not have that ability there. But they're doing that every day in that rural hospital. Or in another, another setting where um, just a week before last I was at a company and the company has completed a broadband build. It's fiber to the home to every customer they serve. They've done it. They're finished with it. All the customers have broadband facilities in a very rural area. The agriculture is chicken farms there. And just last week, I was in uh, an area where it's a farming area, and um, the uh, man I was visiting with told me, let me take you out and show you something. And he showed me some fields. Uh, they were um, cotton fields, I believe, is where we were at in the Mississippi Delta. He said, but nonetheless, Look at the rows. They're all absolutely straight as far as you can see. He said, that's precision agriculture. The machine, when the, the, whoever's got the, the planning machine starts out, he just pushes the button at the beginning of the row, and the internet takes him all the way down the road, and it's absolutely perfectly straight. And he said, not only that, but the seeds that are planted are planted in the same place as the seed was planted last year, that same hole in the ground that was a seed last year because that's where the crop was harvested from. That's a softer plant to plant a seed and it's got rotting roots in it, which is nourishment. So that's precision agriculture. 
I haven't quite seen it or heard it in that context before, I was very impressed. They're doing that because the internet broadband facilities have been in that farming area for about the past 10 years and they've developed a high state of precision agriculture. Wow, all those things are results I see because of what can be done. And what can be done in my context is in a federal government program with lending and with grant funds. And in the documents you've got in front of you, you've got a summary of what our government programs entail. And it's a number of differing programs with differing rules, differing regulations, different application processes and periods. The first program that's listing is an infrastructure program for telephone companies, $590 million a year in government loans to build broadband facilities for rural independent telephone companies. The applications can be accepted at any time. Second program that's listed is a rural broadband loan and loan guarantee program that's authorized under the Farm Bill. And under that program, there's right now around $100 million available. Uh, right now, the program is being rewritten and will be issued this fall as both a grant and loan program under the Farm Bill to um, uh, authorize um, uh, services in rural areas under 20,000 population. So that's yet to come. Um, uh, the program has been there in the past, but right now we're in a bit of a hiatus as the new um, regulations are being issued. The third program listed is called Community Connect Grants, and that's a grant for an area that has no service by any provider. And those grants have been placed around the country to do just that. It's a small program. Last year it was $37 million. The program's generally open for applications early in the calendar year. And then the final program that's listed is a newer program called the ReConnect program. And that program came out just last December. There's been a first round of applications. And after those applications are reviewed and um, awarded, there will be another round coming out in that. $550 million will be available. And that will be perhaps late in this calendar year. And that's a, a series of grants, loans, and combinations of loans and grants for rural broadband services. With all of that, we've got a number of programs that may well fit into what people are looking at doing in a rural area. In addition to that, we have a program that's not listed called the Distance Learning Telemedicine Grant Program. And that's a program with $60 million this past year for uh, grants to hospitals, to uh, schools, to other facilities, to put equipment at the end of communications facilities. And we're using that program in a number of areas. As an example, we've got one entity where it's a major hospital in an urban area, and they're monitoring the ICU beds in the rural hospitals that are surrounding in some very rural areas. And it's a 24-7 monitoring that's done with computer um, uh, programs that are predicting what might happen in a patient. So the doctor may call the rural hospital at two in the morning and say, the computer profile is saying this is about to happen, bed number two, take this medicine down there. The nurse in the rural hospital says, well, I'm not getting any alarms yet. He says, go to bed two, you'll need it when you get there. And uh, saving lives in rural hospitals. It's called distance learning telemedicine. Again, $60 million in grants available in that. We have a lot of things we can do in rural areas with this government money. So um, now I get to the point of where I start with companies. We work with applications and we work in the process of building these things. And the question is, so what can we do? We've identified challenges. Challenges are here in Pennsylvania. Indeed, there are challenges here. What can we do to, do to accomplish goals with that government money that is there. I would suggest the first thing is something that I'm doing. Make as much noise as possible. Let everyone know these programs are there to help the rural areas. These programs exist. Um, these programs can be navigated. The second thing that can be done is maybe things that you can do is make those people in the communities aware that there are government entities that um, assist with lending and with grants and perhaps um, gathering up, we need good applicants. And so the second thing is, is finding in those communities who are good applicants that meet eligibility requirements that can do those things in those areas. The third thing that I would suggest is annoy people. 
and how I annoy people is try to get them to think outside the box. We can think outside the box because historically we've done things in very much the same manner each time. Here's a company that does certain things that applies for certain things. We've been working outside the box in a number of instances. One model that I will um, uh, give you as an example is a project that I've worked on where it's an unusual combination of entities forming a new company to be the applicant. In this case, um, the applicant is 50% owned by an electric cooperative, 50% owned by a telephone company. They've combined their resources that are there, the technology that's there, and also their abilities to serve customers, realizing that these people that they're looking at providing broadband service to are their electric customers, their telephone customers, those people move away. You can't sell a house in that area right now, perhaps. The children are moving away. There's not internet for education or for jobs or whatever. If people continue to move away, their customers move away as well. So there's something in it for them. They formed an entity, applied for a loan, and they got a $20 million loan from the second program, the Farm Bill program, I would call it, to build, and currently they are building in a six county rural area, they're building fiber to the home to all of the customers that would like it in that area. And construction's going on today in that area. So we can think outside the box and we can annoy people to maybe make strategic partnerships. Maybe there are other ways of doing things where entities can come together and provide their common needs for a common goal. So that would be my third thing is suggest to annoy people. A fourth thing that we can do is also assist people with what their projects are. And some of the assistance I can do, some of the assistance can be done through others, maybe through technical grants, through finding other parties, um, because we need good applicants. And then a final thing that can be done, Pennsylvania perhaps um, would be involved in that. Um, I asked Kurt Cockadrilli this morning, the State Director of Rural Development, how can Pennsylvania participate? And he handed me a piece of paper, he knows. How can Pennsylvania participate in our ReConnect program? Um, it's necessary for the state to have done some things in order for applicants to compete in that program. One is there's a number of points associated with a certification letter signed by the governor that the state has a broadband plan that's been adopted by the state. A broadband plan makes us competitive with other applications. A second thing is there's points associated with states that do not restrict utilities from participating in providing broadband. So that's a second part of it and a third part of it is that the state expedite right away in environmental requirements. And I realize there's, in Pennsylvania, just very recently with pole attachments, there's been some very good work done. This expands that and goes a little bit beyond it into right away and environmental matters as well. And so we've got a full text of that we can provide to you if you um, uh, would, would like that as well. But there's things that can be done because the opportunity is not only in the illustrations I gave earlier, the opportunity is right here. Because anytime I see challenges, I also see opportunity connected with it. And how can we utilize federal government and federal funds the best way in order to assist people in accomplishing those things that they would like to do? And rural broadband is just that. Um, I come from a time when we had the old cranker telephones um, I go back 47 years. I go back times when there were areas without telephone service. I go back to times when there was not digital in rural areas. Each time there's a divide. And now there's also a divide in those rural areas because broadband service is essential and an essential uh, facility that we should have in rural areas. Thank you for your time today and thank you very much for your interest. Thank you very much, Mr. Vogt. And if we could, we'd appreciate having those recommendations. I, I can tell you that Representative Snyder and I have worked for several years at 
removing the regulatory barriers to the further deployment of, of high-speed Internet across this Commonwealth, and we would be very interested in, in having that list of things that we need to accomplish in order to um, allow Pennsylvania companies to be able to access those funds for the further deployment. So if we could get that from you, we would really appreciate I it. I am certain that your phone will go ding in just a couple seconds as Mr. Cockadrilli forwards that to I you. I thank you very thank much, you. Mr. Vogt. Mr. Euchre. Good morning, all. Thank you very much. Darren Euchre, Director of State Government Affairs for Pennsylvania Farm Bureau. Thank you for this opportunity. You have my written remarks. Let me just get to a few highlights. You know, I can sit here and cite numerous examples of how agriculture is transforming Pennsylvania agriculture, but let me just highlight the real stories of two farm families, you know, that are trying to build their businesses in Pennsylvania. You know, the, the first is uh, the Bowsher family who live in northern Berks County, really not too far from Allentown as the crow flies. Uh, like a number of farmers, uh, the, this family is trying to capitalize on the emerging popularity of local foods. Customers want to build relationships with their local farmers and are willing to pay a premium for that interaction. In fact, Pennsylvania is one of the top states in the country with the number of farmers who are selling directly to consumers. And that is a tremendous benefit uh, to our farm families. Um, but like a traditional brick and mortar store, uh, customers are expecting that these farm markets have certain levels of service, namely credit card transactions. Um, but due to the lack of high-speed internet service at their farm, the Bouchers had to develop a workaround solution. Um, they couldn't expect to run a cash-only business, and they certainly didn't want their customers to wait around while the credit card transactions were processed over what is essentially dial-up speed. So they found a device that stores all of the credit card transactions for the day. And then when the farm market closes, they bring that device back to their home, hook it up to the Wi-Fi network and let it run for hours at a time processing credit card transactions, hoping that none of those transactions got declined because the customer has long since left the store. But they feel that this is a worthwhile risk uh, because otherwise the alternative is potentially losing sales and losing good word of mouth customer service. So they're willing to make that kind of, um, that kind of risk. Another example is uh, the Corson family, who owns a dairy farm in Center County, and frankly, they're not too terribly far from downtown State College. A few years ago, they made a fairly significant investment in the future of their farm by installing a robotic milker. And if you have never seen a robotic milker, it is amazing technology to see. It is laser-guided precision robotics that takes all of the work that hand milking attachments would typically do. Again, done all by laser guided technology. Incredibly cool to see. It allows the cows to be milked 24 seven. It is an incredible labor saving device for farm families. And also in that system, cows are wearing essentially what is Fitbit, Fitbit technology. They're wearing devices around their necks that monitor all kinds of different health statistics. It analyzes their milk production their heart rate, um, how much they're eating, how much they're drinking. All of that is then uploaded to a computer system where a farmer can open a spreadsheet and look at each individual cow and how she is performing. And then if she, and if she needs individualized attention, he or she can, the farmer can go and deliver that individualized attention. It is amazing technology. Unfortunately for the Corsons, um, they went down this road not knowing how crucial high-speed internet service is to this type of technology. Um, number one, like in a lot of different systems, software upgrades are needed. And number two, technicians can typically remote into the system and perform diagnostic repairs. Unfortunately, with a lack of high-speed service, uh, the, um, the Corsons can't get regular software upgrades and they also need the technician to visit the farm every time something needs to be repaired. They've developed a workaround solution using a cell phone hotspot, but that certainly is not the best use of this technology. And they're still paying $250 a month for satellite service that can blink out if a storm rolls over the valley. These are just two examples of farm families that are trying to utilize emerging technology for the future of Pennsylvania agriculture, uh, but they are just simply being hampered by the lack of reliable broadband service. 
we know the problem is out there. It is well defined. So that's why we're pleased to see some legislative initiatives moving forward to address this problem. You know, in particular, we're supportive of House Bill uh, 305 introduced by Representative Pam Snyder to look at um, what state-owned assets could host broadband technology. Secondly, encouraged by Senate Bill 835 introduced by Senator Wayne Langerholt to create a designated fund to serve as seed money for companies that want to offer broadband service in underserved communities. And we're certainly hopeful that the Senate is going to take up both of these initiatives in the fall. There are steps in the right direction. All that being said, the march of technology is not waiting for rural Pennsylvania to connect to the Internet. If we don't have a robust plan to connect homes and businesses in rural Pennsylvania to digital networks, we face the prospect of shutting out a significant number of our residents from fully being able to connect to emerging technology in all sorts of aspects of their, of their lives. Again, thank you for the opportunity and certainly look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Darren. Mr. Kritz. Thank you, Senator Hill. Can you hear me? And I noticed by the clock that we're out of time, so I really appreciate you coming. And, and uh, <laughs> But uh, no, thank you, Senator uh, Phillips Hill and, and Representative Pam Snyder for being uh, annoying uh, and being tenacious and going after the subject. I, uh, I believe we agree that this might be the most important uh, economic, educational, health care item that we've faced in, in quite a long time. Senator Stefano, Representative Warner, thank you for rep or welcoming us to your districts. Senator Hutchins, it's always good to see you. Welcome to Southern Pennsylvania. Uh, and Representative Cook, thank you so much. Uh, I will uh, do my best to uh, summarize uh, the comments, which are actually a summary of what uh, my original comments were um, as we go forward. Uh, as many of you know, I started my career in public service working for uh, Jack Murtha, actually representing this area. Uh, and he represented this area when we had the extreme loss of uh, steel and coal jobs. Uh, and he spent his career trying to take away reasons companies could say no to moving to this area. So throughout my public service career, I've spent an exorbitant amount of time doing sewage and water infrastructure because many companies will not locate to an area for well water or on-lot sewage treat or, or on-lot septic systems. So we worked on infrastructure as we were going forward to make sure that we were setting the stage and allowing our local communities, pretty much southwestern Pennsylvania, to compete and to attract these companies. Uh, what I can tell you from my perspective is that broadband uh, is just as important and might actually be more important than sewage and water infrastructure were over the last 30 years because it's not about just business. Uh, uh, if you look at broadband, it impacts every uh, economic development issue. Uh, if a company is looking to locate somewhere, they're going to ask you, what is your broadband speeds? Are you connected? Because they're not going to locate there uh, if they can't. They're going to ask you about your educational system. And believe me, as we look at rural schools who are having a hard time uh, recruiting high rigor teachers because of small class sizes, what I envision, what we envision is that at some point, just like colleges have online courses, maybe a physics teacher in one location is teaching physics to seven different schools. So that connectivity becomes that much more important. We look at health care. Uh, several years ago, the, the governor started an initiative, a rural health uh, initiative, to help our rural hospitals who are struggling with maintaining and becoming stable in their finances. But as was mentioned earlier, uh, how about if uh, every three visits or every third visit the person doesn't have to drive to the doctor, they can do it via uh, that internet line. So healthcare is another, where, another place where the impact of broadband is being felt now, has been, been, been impacting that for many years, as long as with education and agriculture. And I go back to agriculture because agriculture is a business. It's one of the largest businesses we have in uh, our largest industries. Senator Costa, leader, nice to see you. <laughs> I didn't get to, I, I said hello to everyone, and I haven't seen you in a, in a while, and I wanted to say hi. Um, is that the agriculture industry right now in Pennsylvania is robust. It has challenges. We have small farms in Pennsylvania. It's a blessing that we have small farms. It's also a challenge because for them to compete, they have to be efficient. They have to compete in the market. And as Darren said, our farmers' markets or our farms 
do a lot of direct selling. It's very important that they can uh, connect to their customers. But if you look at a national economic model, 95% of the consumers in, in this world are outside the United States of America. So this is a global economy. This is not just a local economy. It's about uh, looking at the global economy. 75% uh, of every consumer dollar is spent out outside of this country. So we can't just look at it at, oh, isn't it nice that we have farmers markets and we do that. It's also about competing nationally and internationally. Uh, I can tell the story of the Indiana farmer who wanted to sell pumpkins to uh, Indiana County, by the way, uh, pumpkins to uh, CVS, and they said, well, you got to, you know, it's an online process. You have to do everything online. And this person had no access, had no way to do this, and then became uncompetitive. So this is about competition. This is about raising uh, the level of competitiveness of our agriculture industries as well as all other industries. It's about giving our rural youth an opportunity to compete in an educational form where when they go on to college or go on to their next stage of life that they can uh, compete with people who have greater access or have more opportunities. It's about making sure our rural uh, folks are getting the health care that they deserve that the health care is not something that is only for people in the city. So I, I talk about those things because the broadband question permeates so many different aspects of our life that it is so key to the future of our state, the future of our nation. Uh, and I look at what the administration has um, proposed and what the administration has done. And I'll tell a quick story is, you know, some of you, and I'm, I'm sure Pam and Kristen, you know that um, CAF2, Verizon, turned down a lot of the Connect America Fund money, and we were in this quandary as to, well, it's our money, how do we get it? And, and FCC was uh, sort of stodgy in their way that they were going to release it. And what impressed me was when the administration and Governor Wolf stepped up and said, okay, how can we develop a fund that helps to supplement our local people to compete, to, to bid on the CAF2 money when they came around for the second auction, and as we know, Tri-County REA was able to get a $32 million grant from uh, FCC with $17.5 million through PennDOT, which who would have thought 10 years ago that PennDOT would be helping to fund a, a, a broadband project in northern Pennsylvania, and also a million and a half in, uh, in RCAP money. But what that told me was that, and I think you've all experienced this, is that this administration is looking to be creative, to think outside the box, to say, how can we make things happen? How can we develop the assets that we have, take advantage of the assets we have, and then make that into a bigger picture? Which brings me to, uh, as was mentioned by Wayne, the Restore Initiative. Um, you know, uh, as a member of Congress who used to sit on that side of the, uh, of the table, you know, you look at, okay, well, what are the financial impacts? What, what are we really talking about here? What's the future? Where are we going and where do we want to be? Um, and I looked at the, the Restore program and I said, okay, you know, they com we compare Pennsylvania to Texas and, and Texas produces 21% more gas but gets 700% more revenue. And I thought, well, that's, that's pretty significant. What's going on here? And as something that you may or may not know is that as a member of Congress, I co-formed the Marcella Shell Gas Caucus in Congress with Representative Tom Reed. So this is a big issue for me. Um, and what I was told from industry then was you should have a severance fee. And I thought, well, why is that? And they said, because that way, when companies are looking at your region, they can compare it apples to apples to other regions as well, and it makes it easier for them to, to do investments. So what I see is 21% more gas, 700% more revenue, uh, and the report from the independent uh, uh, agency said that 80% of the funds will actually be paid for by folks outside of Pennsylvania. So I think that's good for Pennsylvania. But why I think it's so important, we are past, long past, I believe, in doing the project by project to expand broadband. We've been doing that for 20 years. As Wayne said, do we want to wait another 25 years, 26 years to solve this problem? We're past these one-off projects. We need a vision of what the future looks like. And, and from my perspective, you want to say to companies, to people looking at Pennsylvania, we know where we're going and we know how we're gonna get there. Now, having been on your side of the, the, this equation, this is a negotiation. This is about 
okay, well, how do we really get there? Is, you know, is restore as it's defined going to be exactly what the final product is? Probably not, but it's a negotiation. And what gives me hope is what took place with the farm bill. You know, the administration, the Secretary of Agriculture, we start doing listening sessions. Then we did an economic analysis. Then we derived some priorities as to where agriculture was going. Uh, and then working, the administration working closely with the legislature came up with legislation to move the Farm Bill forward. It was a very bipartisan effort, and it's about where are we going? What are the opportunities? Where are the challenges, and how do we address them? And how do we put Pennsylvania on the map and move us forward? Um, that's what I see with the Restore Act, and where I think the administration would like to see us go is working with the uh, General Assembly to say, how do we do this? You know, it, it's, we haven't been able to solve this problem. I don't think we can wait. Uh, we're at a, an inflection point. Well, we were at an inflection point actually about 10 years ago. It's time to really have that vision move forward. Uh, and, you know, even talking about restore outside of uh, broadband, you know, it's going to be good for agriculture too. It, it, a shocking statistic that came to light as I was developing this uh, um, testimony was that from 2012 to 2017, we lost half a million acres of farmland in Pennsylvania. In all the years of farmland preservation, we just broke half a million acres in the last couple of years. Um, so looking at the 2,000 farms that are on the list, the 15,000 farms that are still elig or are eligible for that, it's going to take about a half a billion dollars to do all that. Restore actually has money in there to help with those kind of things. It has money in there to do conservation to help farmers who are trying to meet the Chesapeake Bay uh, watershed improvements, but also the things that we're going to see statewide. So I'll conclude there. Uh, again, the, I'm very passionate about this subject, in case you couldn't tell, um, because I think it's so important to so many facets of our life that I appreciate this opportunity to, uh, to testify. Again, uh, Senator Phillips Hills, Representative Snyder, I, I applaud you for your tenacity because this is what we need to do. We need to keep pushing and pushing to make people aware how important this issue is. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you very much. I'm going to recognize Representative Cook for a question. Well, it's actually, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, presenters. You left out um, party lines. You left out AAA for tractors and some other things. Darren, last week, the Farm Bureau in Washington County actually invited, and we had the pleasure and the honor and the opportunity to visit the Martin Farm, and they had a automatic milker. And growing up on a farm actually milking cows and seeing the technology today, we can sit here and we can listen about technology and we can talk about technology, but getting out there and actually seeing a third generation farmer in their 20s making that transition and, and addressing such a vital need kind of prioritizes where we need to be at on broadband and how it affects, you know, the whole thing. So my question would be back to you all across the board, and, and thank you again very much. We become better legislators when we actually go out and see things, in my opinion, and see the effects that it has on family. And personally, I'm seriously concerned about that transition on the farm to that third and fourth generation because it has to be commoditized and it has to be profitable and it has to be upgraded. So the question would be back to your membership, to the Farm Bureau, to the Grange. You got to reach out to our other legislators that aren't represented here today and senators and get them on site and put a face on the technology and the importance of the broadband. Uh, just real quick, Representative, two thoughts. That's uh, one of the main reasons that our county farm bureaus want to have legislative farm tours, and they happen all across the state uh, during the month of, of, of August to talk about these emerging issues. You know, the other thing I'll note is the, the, the two families that I mentioned in my testimony, the farmers are under the age of 40. They are the next generation. They are engaged. They want to raise their families here and hopefully get that third, fourth generation. 
Um, so all the more important of why it is so important for us to develop, you know, a robust plan for broadband and, and also all of the other issues that are that are impacting agriculture. But thank you for sharing that. And uh, again, one of the main reasons that we want to have representatives come to the farm so that they can see the real world application of how these issues are affecting our industry. May I address that also? Um, I'd, I'd like to say I totally agree with you because seeing is believing. And for about the last year, the Pennsylvania State Grange has been working with the Philadelphia delegation to try and get a trip planned to Penn State University, the main campus, that they can physically see what's going on in agriculture today and what Penn State is doing to try and advance agriculture. And with that, in the new Pennsylvania Farm Bill, uh, you said that the families under under 20 years or in the 20s, there is uh, provisions in there to help young people try and move into agriculture. And it is so um, hard. The reason I was I left dairy was because my brother was 13 is 13 years older than I am. When I was 26 years old, I realized when I became 52, 53, I was gonna to have to spend a million to a million and a half so I could work another 13 years. How many of you wanna fit into those shoes? So I decided it was best for me to exit the dairy industry at that time. Um, you know, I, I dearly miss the equipment and the field work. The cows weren't my really um, most favorite but that's where the money was at for us. If you didn't have the cows, you didn't have the income. But, but you know, you're right. If, if we don't groom this next generation and somehow or other make it possible, that possible for them to get into ag business or into agriculture, we're gonna lose even more farms than what's been talked about. And for every farm that's lost, I'd like you to think of a farm as a sponge. And when that sponge goes away, because it's been covered with, with blacktop or concrete, you've just increased the runoff, you've just increased the flood potential for downstream. So I, I like to remember back to high school when they say for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. In some case, I think the opposite reaction is a lot worse. The, the impact. The impact. Th thank you very much. Um, Mr. Campbell, and, and if we could, I, I would just like to say that you know, our farmers have always been smart, and now we know that the future of farming is smart. And so I appreciate all the technologies that you've laid out, uh, the opportunities for funding to further deploy a lot of these technologies. And I would say to, to Mr. Kritz, three years ago you and I were on a panel at the farm show at the uh, invitation of the Pennsylvania State Grange, and I think you shared something that helped annoy me and, and spur <laughs> me on, and that was that the governor really wasn't focused or interested in this, and we could talk about it after he was reelected. And um, I, I think I came back at you, maybe it was a little pithy because I was annoyed, and, and I, I appreciate that the governor has identified this as, as something that needs to be addressed. I, I will say this, before we can begin to think about um, taxing Pennsylvanians, um, we have to identify, we have to wrap our arms around the size, scope, and magnitude of this problem. We need to identify the solutions that we can deploy, and we have to put a price tag on it. A and what I would say is we need the governor to work with us to do that, because at this point, we don't have the answers to those questions. And that's what Representative Snyder and I have endeavored to do over the last almost four years. That's what this committee is endeavoring to do. And before we can even begin to have a conversation about a tax, that's what we need to do. So thank you very much. And uh, appreciate your, your testimony here today. And we look forward to our last panel. Well, we will now move on to that final panel of the day and very happy to have us uh, joining us here today are Commissioner Andrew Place from the Pennsylvania Public Utility Commission, Mr. Josh Motzer, State Government Relations Director for CenturyLink, 
Fran Bradley, Chairman of the Broadband Cable Association of Pennsylvania and Director of Government Affairs for Atlantic Broadband, and Tom Musgrove, who is the Government Affairs Manager from Crown Castle. And uh, again, I would like to thank everyone uh, for being here today. And if you could um, summarize your submitted remarks for, for testimony, we would really appreciate it. So, Commissioner Place, if I could ask you to, to begin, we'd appreciate it. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, Chairman Phillips Hill, Leader Costa, and honorable members of the committee, uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify today on certain issues of broadband access and availability. I will note, as a farmer, I raise sheep in Greene County. Um, this is also a, a personal of interest and something that I have anecdotal experience with. Um, it goes, runs the gambit from when my children were homeschooled, uh, we had dial-up, so it was very difficult for my children to be connected, and that digital divide was very obvious. Um, also, I have a home in Pittsburgh in uh, Senator Costa's district, and the divide between those is absolutely stunning. Um, we have a pipe this big coming into our house, and you can do whatever you want all day long, and you have no sense that there's any restriction out there. Uh, I spent time on my farm. I watched the squirrel run the, the data packets up and down the line. Um, and that has is also when I'm on the commission, uh, whether it's uh, my smart meters being mesh connected, um, the limitations of that communication link. So um, across the board and what I see in the commission, um, as a resident, you also see the limitations of many of the technologies we need, not only in telecommunications and connectivity for health and school, but also how we integrate all the smart grid technologies we have out there and the inability of rural residents to really maximize and love the energy, energy efficiency benefits um, and aggregation, et cetera, demand response that um, many of our res other residents have and we don't. Um, and I'd also noticed last night I was working on PC work. I was looking at, um, at real data hog material out of the Chesapeake Bay watershed, looking at their environmental attributes. Uh, and even with, and I'll note in my comments, um, I have satellite now um, to, for internet connection, which is pretty good, um, although it's 20 gigabit limit per month, um, which is a constraint. Um, and certainly I'm not streaming any films or anything else in my, my residence in Greene County. But um, pulling down big data sets uh, for commission work um, is time consuming, and you go make a cup of coffee, go make yourself some lunch before you come back and see these data sets pulled down. Um, but as you know, you have my testimony in front of you. I just wanted to make a couple of brief references. Um, much of this we all know, um, all the, uh, the background on Chapter 30, et cetera. Um, but I would note that the, uh, the FCC's uh, base broadband speed standard is 25 megabits per download and 3 megabits upload, as noted in Philip Siller today. Um, naturally, that's, that far exceeds what the Chapter 30 limitations had or expectations had back in the day. Um, I would make brief attention to um, the CAF Phase 2 money, um, which deployed broadband um, at the 10-1 speed. Um, the accepted amount of support in Pennsylvania was $166 million over six years at 76,000 odd locations. Um, additionally, August 28, 2018, um, the results of the CAF, the 903 CAF 2 auction, um, there were five winners within Pennsylvania, uh, which brought an additional 56.83 million over 10 years into the Commonwealth, supporting 54,000 odd homes, as well as noted as well earlier today, the Governor's Office Broadband Initiative providing um, balancing funds for 17.1 million. As well, I would, would draw attention to one of those winners, the Tri-County Rural Electric in the Northern Tier, um, is putting in uh, fiber op optic facilities capable of one gigabit per second, um, and they are currently running through the PUC approval process and obtaining uh, the applicable support through uh, the federal CAF too. The, um, I'd also note, um, it hasn't been mentioned today, it was on August 2nd, 2019 this year, um, the FCC issued a Rural Digital Opportunity Fund, Rudolph, um, 
there's no L in it, so it's not the, the reindeer, but um, proposal as with an additional federal support for $20.4 billion over 10 years for the deployment of additional broadband access networks across the U.S. Um, such services will have a baseline performance at the 25-3 standard. Um, the federal Rudolph initiatives of immediate and vital interest to, the Pen to Pennsylvania, and the Commission is in the process of studying uh, the proposed rulemaking out of the FCC. Um, additionally, as noted, um, the, the importance of E-rate, um, I will not go into the details of, for the sake of brevity, um, has been fundamentally important and continues to be fundamentally important. Um, it should be noted that PUC does not have direct involvement with the E-rate program as these are federally funds. However, the Commission does certify or otherwise exercise regulatory oversight of, over incumbent and competitive telecommunications carriers, so we have an indirect regulatory oversight. Um, in closing, I would note that the importance of sort of the, the baseline that was set up in Chapter 30, but also the, the federal component and the ongoing state support is fundamentally important. I would also um, note that the, in answer to your questions earlier, um, Senator Cost asked a question about the um, E-rate support. Um, it's currently $9.25, $9.25. Uh, per, low in, per certain low-income customers. And to put that in perspective, um, uh, for um, a, a, a pretty typical program, about $30 a month, uh, which is DSL light, and that's about a 24% support level for low-income households. Um, however, for the um, higher speeds um, um, of 25.4 within the Commonwealth, generically, that's closer to about a 20, 18 percent support level. So meaningful, but not does not cover the the need of many hundreds of thousands of our low income customers. Um, Representative Senator St Stefano, sorry, um, you asked a question about affordability, um, and I pinged my office because I know I work a lot on electricity issues, and we know these questions about um, how many low income customers we have, and that's the data you need to know what how big this issue is. Um, and I do know it for electric, but uh, I realize they do not know it for the tele telecommunications or broadband side. So um, my office is committed to getting that material together for you and seeing if we match the granularity we have on uh, the electric side to really know what the low impact issue is on this. Um, and um, uh, Senator Phillips Hill, you asked about the E-rate cap. Um, um, I filed comments with the FCC on August 27th, um, opposed to that uh, hard cap. So hopefully that is of, of some value as, as well as noting the Commission's um, rulemaking last week on uh, reverse preemption of pole attachments, which is, a, I, I think, a fundamentally important piece to uh, rural broadband build out throughout the Commonwealth. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll close. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Mr. Motzer. Uh, to the chairwoman, and you got my last name right, so kudos, thank you. Uh, and to, to the leader and to the senators for hosting and also the representatives, thank you for the opportunity to allow CenturyLink to contribute uh, in this important broadband discussion, um, but also to help identify some of the regulatory challenges uh, that are faced by companies like CenturyLink and my peers uh, that hinder our ability to maximize the investment in broadband. Uh, today, I want to present some obstacles that we have, but also um, look at some solutions that we can present. And, and again, this is all in partnership with the folks at the legislature as well as the private sector. For background, CenturyLink provides residential voice and broadband services in 37 states and provide business services uh, through our extensive global fiber network. Uh, that's a low latency fiber network that's uh, layered with cybersecurity intelligence throughout the world. We employ over 40,000 associates around the world um, with, with nearly about 650 here in the Commonwealth. CenturyLink has been operating here in Pennsylvania for many decades. Um, our traditional roots are in the incumbent telephone company business um, and providing voice services um, in both residential and business across 25 counties. Um, but now we operate in a competitive market, marketplace covering video, data, and, um, and voice services and all likes. Specific to broadband in Pennsylvania, CenturyLink has met its statutory obligations under Chapter 30 in Act 183, and uh, to the Commissioner's point, I think you all have heard uh, a lot of the, the details associated with that program, but we all know that obviously it provided a baseline of 1.5 meg uh, broadband available to all of our customers. Now, obviously the demand is very different now. Uh, we clearly understand that. Um, but that results in additional costs uh, as providers, 
We have to provide additional fiber. We have to provide additional electronics. Um, it's just to meet that expanding demand of our customers. So in response to that demand, CenturyLink has continued to make network investments uh, up to uh, gigabit speeds over fiber. I um, mean, Carlisle, Hanover, New Oxford, Marysville, numerous locations throughout the state. But in places where high capital investments for broadband can't support the business case, we may seek alternative funding. It's been mentioned uh, one program is CAF. Uh, CenturyLink was one of the largest participants in CAF around the nation. Um, some of the numbers that the commissioner gave specific to, to the Commonwealth um, kind of net look more nationally, CenturyLink uh, sought 1.2 million rural homes and businesses that would deploy, we deploy um, high speed internet to uh, those homes and businesses across the country. Of those 1.2 million, um, just over 30,000 uh, were here in the Commonwealth and again within our local footprint. And then to, to uh, the commissioner's point, at a speed of a minimum of 10 1. The three obstacles I want to mention, um, financial, technical, uh, and regulatory. For financial, the, the, beyond the statutory obligations, CenturyLink has to make investments based on a reasonable business case and, and a return on our investment. Um, simple math, if it takes, makes CenturyLink $30,000 to deploy a mile of fiber, and I'm only able to secure, with 100% take rate, 10 customers, um, obviously, uh, an individual a customer return needs to be roughly $3,000. Well, that same $30,000 investment over 100 customers you know, drops my, my cost to only $300. So you can see, and again, I'm, I know I'm reiterating that point, but I think it's, it's noted that these investments obviously you know, seek a return, um, and you have to look at the density challenges that we have. The technical aspect is to note that installing individual fiber to every home in rural areas is just not economically feasible. Um, but in response to that, CenturyLink's um, leveraging our, our existing network assets by installing fiber and upgrading electronics to our remote devices that then ultimately leverage and connect those homes using the last mile of copper facilities. Now a customer very close to that device can get speeds up to 80 meg. Right? Now further away from that device, those speeds decline, but it's a, it's a, a uh, um, it's a, it's a broadband speed that is comparable to um, speeds that you're seeing in, in other markets. Um, but again, it's maximizing the ex existing investments that are, that are there. Uh, lastly, for obstacles, the, the regulatory environment that exists today is outdated. Um, just a few decades ago, before the internet and broadband growth of today, CenturyLink had the full service market uh, in our local footprint. So that meant we, we were the only voice provider with no competitors in those particular footprints. Clearly, that is a a bit of a different working space than it is. It was just a shoot, uh, short decade ago, I'm sorry, two decades ago. Uh, today, enough customers have switched to cell phones um, that wireless connections outnumber those of traditional landlines. Traditional cable TV companies have moved into the business beyond video services and providing broadband and voice. Um, the significant element that hasn't changed, though, between the old and the new marketplace is this outdated regulatory environment. It just hasn't adjusted accordingly to match the competitive landscape. I do want to be clear, CenturyLink's not suggesting that our competitors be regulated to the same degree that we are, um, but we're suggesting that most of the regulations that apply uh, to just the traditional voice providers uh, would need to be substantially reduced or eliminated in order to level that playing field. Uh, I think the solutions is the key part of the testimony to close. Uh, I draw your attention in my written testimony to the broadband grant tool uh, it's, a, it's an explorer tool that the Pew Charitable Trust created. Um, and again, this is a, a neutral site that just inventoried all of the programs that are out there across the country. There are numerous programs ranging in all funding levels and all uh, criteria within them. And this gives you an opportunity, both as a committee as well as uh, the future advisory council, an opportunity to look at what's working, what's been challenging. Uh, and it's all aggregated here within the, the link. So it's on uh, page six. I'll call your attention to that. Uh, obviously, CenturyLink has participated in a number of these programs. There's some we haven't, because um, obviously some of the criteria has been more challenging to adhere to. Um, the more successful programs, we would note, obviously, they're not limited to just these provisions, but in my testimony, I note we need to protect investment from overbuilding. I clearly noted that CenturyLink has spent billions of dollars investing in our network. We'd prefer not to be overbuilt, uh, including robust challenge process, so that we can identify and get to the heart of uh, where an unserved or underserved community might be. 
We encourage public-private partnerships. We want to talk to those communities. You all know your communities and your constituents well. We want to partner as the private sector. And lastly, there's a weighted scoring system that can help contribute to maximizing uh, the usage of the limited funding. Um, second, uh, we, we obviously intend and, and hope that we can reduce and ultimately eliminate the unnecessary regulatory burdens of, of voice services and on the network today. I note also in this uh, similar area of the testimony that the National Regulatory Research Institute uh, has a, there's a link that includes one study, but then multiple other studies around all of the reform that's went into telecom policy reform. They note that 35 states have passed legislation limiting direct oversight of the retail wireline telecommunications services. So uh, I, I put that statistic in there to say that we are not at the beginnings of the policy reform discussions. Uh, we are well into it and decades into it. So we'd encourage the Commonwealth to consider those. Um, uh, as closed with a Public Utilities Commission initiated a proceeding in September 2018 to review many of these regulations. Um, and the industry filed comments in that proceeding and, and urged the commission to reduce or eliminate many of those regulations. Furthermore, that the industry filed a waiver uh, to suggest the elimination of those certain outdated regulations. They are both still pending at the, the commission. Uh, I do want to recognize, and I think the commissioner, you mentioned it, the pull attachment case um, that was uh, just passed within the commission. And again, that needs to be recognized, and it was great work. That's a significant undertaking from the commission um, to recognize that um, that is one of the many challenges that it takes to deploy broadband and pulling some of those resources in house is appropriate, so thank you. Um, again, and, and, and lastly, CenturyLink will continue to explore um, any regulatory and legislative opportunities that might be out there to, to continue to provide parity across the competitive marketplace. Um, so in closing, thank you for the opportunity, and uh, specifically uh, to the Chair, thank you for including within Senate Resolution 47 that acknowledgement of uh, the regulatory challenges within the industry. Um, you know, and, and thank you for the opportunity, and I uh, appreciate the time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Bradley. Good afternoon. I'm Fran Bradley, Director of Government Affairs for Atlantic Broadband, and I also serve as Chairman for the Broadband Cable Association of Pennsylvania, more commonly known as BCAP, representing large, small, and medium-sized cable operators across the state. The cable industry was actually created right here in Pennsylvania back in 1948 as a rural service to bring the magic of TV to the hills and to the customers in the hills and valleys um, that couldn't receive TV broadcast signals. Today, the cable industry is taking a similar track in the Commonwealth, extending access to gigabit broadband service to 99% of the customers in our cable footprints, or 95% of the Pennsylvania households. I appreciate the opportunity to be here today and to share my thoughts regarding broadband services especially in some of the more rural areas, such as those where Atlantic Broadband provides service. Atlantic Broadband is the eighth largest cable operator in the country, providing video, internet, and phone services to homes and businesses in rural parts of Maine, New Hampshire, Connecticut, New York, Delaware, Maryland, West Virginia, Virginia, South Carolina, Florida, and of course right here in Pennsylvania. We believe that Pennsylvania is a great place to work and live and have, has a tremendous workforce of dedicated employees. We have several work locations throughout the state of Pennsylvania, including right here in Fayette County and Uniontown. We directly employ over 560 Pennsylvanians with 90 right here in Uniontown and over 100 different contractors across the state. We operate in about 250 communities in Pennsylvania's state's rural areas across 17 counties in Fayette, Green, Washington, Union, Mifflin, McKean, Clearfield, Luzerne, Cambria, Blair, and several other counties. We just made the announcement of the availability of gigabit service in our western Pennsylvania areas and have already done so in our Johnstown, Altoona, Bradford, Warren, and Pocono systems. This same type of broadband rollout is being done by all of our BCAP members across the state. We want to work with you and other partners to close the digital divide. We acknowledge that there are problems with the FCC's existing mapping system, 
which overstates broadband coverage. The Internet and Tele Television Association, NCTA, and ACA Connects are urging the FCC to redefine the data collection process to a more granular and accurate collection model called shapefile mapping, already proposed in the Federal House and Senate. This same type of process that is supported by NCTA and ACA Connects is also supported by the American Farm Bureau Association, the National Rural Electric Cooperative Association, Connected Nation, and the Competitive Carrier Association because it will more efficiently and quickly provide information needed to create more accurate maps, allowing for more efficient use of government resources. Unfortunately, as you've heard earlier, these reports were set back, in our opinion, in June by the Center for Rural Pennsylvania's report called the Broadband Availability and Access in Rural Pennsylvania, which commingled availability and adoption and a flawed speed test to add to the confusion. Broadband is available if it can be purchased from a cable, telecommunications, wireless, or other provider. Broadband is adopted if a person actually purchases the speed, the service. Broadband must be available before it can be adopted, and speeds chosen by an individual customers may not be the same as those available in a given area. 95% of the 5 million homes in Pennsylvania have cable broadband available to them, and almost 99% have access to speeds up to 1 gigabit. Customers may choose a speed that they feel meets their needs, as low as maybe 10 megabits, even if 25 megabits is available. That report failed to clarify this fact, and the speeds reported didn't indicate the speeds available. Unfortunately, we don't feel that the CRP study advanced the cause for rural broadband. BCAP urges them to join us in ways to extend broadband in rural Pennsylvania. And our members are already doing just that. On the northeastern part of the state, Blue Ridge in Monroe County is partnering with local communities to aggregate demand and extend service. German Township, right here in Fayette County, is using part of their franchise fee to partner with Atlantic Broadband to extend broadband into several of their rural areas within the township. Atlantic Broadband and Comcast are working with the Pennsylvania Office of Broadband Initiatives on a weekly basis to reevaluate the economics of expanding the company's footprints in specific areas. Unfortunately, these efforts are not enough. In some hard to reach, densely challenged, unserved areas, it's just not economic for providers to deploy and operate broadband networks without some type of governmental support. In those cases, we support a technology-neutral program that focuses tax taxpayer dollars on areas most in need. Our companies want to be part of the solutions and partnering with federal, state, and local governments to do just that. Armstrong, as you heard earlier, the Butler-based company, provides service in 17 Pennsylvania counties. And using the CAF America Fund, CAF II, and PennDOT incentives are extending broadband in eastern Erie, Crawford, and Mercer counties. They're using the CAF II and the New York State Broadband Fund, building 3,200 miles of broadband infrastructure in rural New York. If Pennsylvania wants a program to advance the deployment of broadband in rural areas, Here's a proven framework to make it a reality. Identify and invest only in unserved areas. That would be those areas lacking 25 over 3 speeds. Limit the eligibility to non-governmental entities with a track record of building and operating high-speed broadband infrastructures, preferably already here in Pennsylvania. Prohibit governmental overbuilding. It's unnecessary and inefficient. The dollars need to be focused on unserved versus underserved. 
require the non-governmental entities to fund a minimum of 25% of the proposed project with private capital and be technology neutral. This framework that I've just outlined is in Senate Bill 835, the Unserved High-Speed Broadband Funding Pilot Program Act, sponsored by Senator Wayne Lingerholm. SB 835 is modeled after the FCC's successful CAF-2 program, which when coupled with PennDOT incentives, is enabling companies like Tri-County Rural Electric and Armstrong to expand in rural Pennsylvania. BCAP urges you all to consider and support this Senate bill. Madam Chair, I thank you and the members of the committee and the representatives here for allowing me to speak to you on behalf of BCAP and Atlantic Broadband, and I would be happy to try to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much, Mr. Bradley. Mr. Musgrove. Well, realizing I'm keeping everybody between lunch and the rest of their day, I'll do my best to paraphrase myself. Um, thank you for your leadership on this, Senator Phillips Hill, and thank you for hosting Senator Stefano, and it's a pleasure to be here and represent uh, Crown Castle and helping to think about solutions for rural broadband. Crown Castle is the nation's largest provider of communication infrastructure and in Pennsylvania alone we have over 2,100 towers and 1,100 route miles of fiber that support local governments, schools, and public safety entities through the Commonwealth. Uh, given the breadth of our, our infrastructure, we have a unique uh, perspective on how we look at solutions to rural broadband. And uh, today I'll share with you some of my thoughts and opinions on how we expand wireless coverage into remote areas through the promotion of wireless internet service providers, how small cells and 5G can help supplement the promotion of wireless, uh, wireless coverage throughout the Commonwealth, and then ultimately how the approval process for siting communication infrastructure at the state level has the ability to promote new deployment of new broadband technology which should support uh, rural broadband growth. As Mr. Motzer referenced, you know, I, I think people look at fiber as the, uh, the immediate silver bullet that's going to cure everything and, and, you know, realistically due to the challenges that running fiber to every home, it's just not a realistic feasible situation. Um, you know, there is, there is plenty of available funding there and I will not, re you know, repeat some of the available funds that are out there because it's been covered. But the question becomes how do we allocate these funds? And I, I think what, what Senator Phillips Hill mentioned earlier was that you need a plan and you need to think about how you're going to cover the most amount of people with the least amount of capital and deploy that effectively and that's a combination of taking a look at private entities working uh, with public entities giving local governments the opportunity to build out their own fiber networks looking at the electrical co-ops which have opportunity to be extremely successful and then what crown castle specializes in utilizing existing infrastructure co-locating on existing infrastructure and then creating new infrastructure with private capital whenever you have the opportunity to build out new, uh, new facilities. There are companies in the communication industry that are called wireless internet service providers. Our industry term for that, we call them WISPs. Um, they provide rural broadband, they provide rural connectivity across the United States. WISP utilize existing infrastructure like our cell phone towers or like Commonwealth cell phone towers to be able to provide wireless internet service coverage and they actually can meet some of those uh, uh, high speed broadband speeds. Depending on the topography of a region and how close a tower is to a WISP customer, you can feasibly cover a large geographic area with a little bit of capital. Um, you know, we take a look at how much, you know, we, we work with WISPs nationally, um, so we have you know, dozens of companies that we work with across the nation. And as we kind of looked at their construction costs in preparation for this meeting today, we saw that their construction costs ranged from ten to $15,000 per site. So if you extrapolated that over, let's say 10 sites, and you're talking about $150,000 worth of capital at max, and you can cover maybe about 100 square miles of people with high-speed wireless internet service. You know, the challenge is with some of these wireless internet service providers is that they are mostly startup companies. Uh, they're not as well funded as major carriers are. So, you know, thinking about how they have support is very important to them for them to be successful in the long term. Um, there is a company that just started in Center County uh, providing wireless internet service. Uh, I think it was probably last month. It's in Center County. They co-located on three county sites. 
And, uh, you know, it'd be interesting to see how they develop over time and how successful they are providing rural, broad, rural wireless broadband to homes. Um, the additional challenge that we just run into, and this is more of an industry problem that's been echoed multiple times today, is just regu regulation, uh, red tape. I think that the ability to reduce red tape has the byproduct of allowing those funds to find their way to construction. And if you want to provide more coverage, you need money to go into construction and reduce the amount of time that's being spent on engineering or zoning meetings or uh, no offense to any of the attorneys in the room, attorneys that are representing companies in any of these meetings. And, and finding ways to get deployment of infrastructure and get stuff constructed is, is paramount to building out more you know, technology throughout the Commonwealth. Um, as we talk about 5G, I would be remiss if I didn't, if I didn't bring this up and, and uh, you know, 5G and small cells and House Bill 1400 is introduced last, uh, last spring in June. When we talk about small cells, sp small cells technically work with, with towers and fiber uh, to pro provide coverage and capacity where it's not readily available. Um, so capacity in places where large swaths of data are being used coverage in places that towers just don't quite provide that coverage. Um, Pennsylvania has a unique challenge that many states don't. We have over 2,500 municipalities uh, that have their own sets of rules and regulations on how they handle small cells and utility poles in the public right of way. This can create 2,500 different processes to comply with. Um, you know, providing a statewide legislation through House Bill 1400 would allow uniformity for fees and process across the Commonwealth, which should promote construction of new small cells. I bring this up because when we're currently looking at 5G rollout plans, and I know that 5G necessarily isn't apples to apples here for this discussion, but when you're looking at the carrier's build plans right now, where anything's public, you can Google it today, you do not see any Pennsylvania cities on it. You know, the carriers are avoiding Pennsylvania because of the, the regulatory red tape, it's just too challenging and those, that, that capital is being spent in other states. You know, how do we create a regulatory environment that pulls capital back into the Commonwealth and allows proliferation of infrastructure that expands beyond our urban areas? I think that would you know, allow more small cells to be built and a byproduct of small cells because they run off of electric and fiber is that you would see a larger fiber footprint in the Commonwealth. You know, obviously it'll take time, but right now, the, the environment from a regulatory standpoint does look to be restrictive, and the evidence is, is that people are just building elsewhere. Um, you know, creating that favorable rural broadband plan, as uh, Senator Phillips Hill said, in concert with electrical co-ops, I think, I think you're on the right path. I think that's, and then figuring out how much bang you can get out of the buck out of each location, I think that's the way that you, you help solve the rural broadband plan. I think, you know, Crown Castle as a, as a company supports uh, the, the infrastructure that's going to be required to build it out and provide coverage to rural areas. And, um, you know, for the sake of time, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to be here today and happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you very much. Um, really appreciate the testimony today. Commissioner Place, I have to thank you for being here. We were very fortunate to have Chairman Brown Dutrell. Um, with us in Monroe County and Commissioner Kennard with us out in Indiana County. And again, do need to thank um, the Public Utility Commission for it, its most recent rulemaking. We know it has to go on to IRC, but we're very encouraged and see that as, as a good step forward. But um, as Mr. Musgrove very um, eloquently pointed out, um, he said one of the by 5G network across the state is an increased fiber optic cable footprint as fiber is fundamental to 5G. More small cells is more fiber. And said that reduced investment in Pennsylvania is due to the unpredictability of the regulatory environment at the local level. Now, I, I will tell you that Government red tape was actually manufactured in York County. So those government regulations <laughs> got their name of being red tape because they were bound by red tape that was manufactured at York Narrow Fabrics Company in York. Um, so uh, I, I feel a, a great sense of responsibility to help cut that red tape since we manufactured it. Um, but I, I will say this, that we've heard about this need of modernizing our telecom 
regulations at every hearing that we have held. Um, my understanding is we haven't updated them since the 1980s. And earlier this year, um, Chairman Brown Dutrell indicated that the PUC's proceedings to look at updating regulations, specifically I understand chapter 63 and 64, could be expected in the calendar year. So I'm hoping that you could provide us with a status update of, of where the commission is with updating those telecom uh, regulations, as well as if you expect that, you know, we heard this, the same things here today that we've heard previously, will they address the concerns that, that this panel has raised about the regulatory barriers to further deployment of, of high-speed internet service in the Commonwealth? Um, yeah, unfortunately, I cannot give you a, sitting here today, give you an update of where we are. Um, as a commissioner, we tend to, since we are the final adjudicator of what comes before us, um, we remain hands off. We're firewalled until um, those recommendations come before us by our staff. That said, um, I will um, have a conversation with the staff that are, are doing that work in technical utility services um, and give you an update of what is available from those folks. But as I noted, unfortunately, I'm, I'm walled off from knowing where we are and insulting the mind head of any ruling I would ultimately rule on. I, I appreciate that very much and would look forward to having as much of a conversation as we possibly can because it has become a consistent theme that we've heard throughout our hearings process and um, certainly um, we would like to do as much as we possibly can to get out of the way of seeing that deployment happen. So I thank you very much. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I, I certainly understand the challenges. Um, uh, you know, the obligations, um, the, the yin and the yang, or the, the tensions of uh, regulatory, what is regulatory and what is not regulatory, and, uh, and especially in this space that is phenomenally evolving. You wouldn't have thought when I came on the commission that telecommunication was a, was a lively subject. I thought this would have been settled many decades ago. Um, but just like in the electric sector as well, um, it is a very dynamic space. And, and the interface between the FCC and the PUC or between FERC and the PUC, um, those bright lines no longer exist and don't make a lot of sense in, in many cases. Um, uh, for example, the distributed antenna system work we've been doing, um, that interac uh, interaction uh, between what sort of historically was wireless, but now you've got all this backhaul on um, fiber, um, that is historically a PUC oversight. Um, so where those interface and interact is never really, was never really contemplated, as you pointed out, in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, or 80s, when this, these systems and these old, these old lines really don't serve the public interest. Um, so whether it's on the electric side, the natural gas side, um, the interaction of gas electric or electric and phone, telephone and so on, telecommunications, um, all of these are burgeoning issues that uh, we do need absolutely to be fundamentally um, uh, adept at uh, managing that space. So um, you certainly have my sincere commitment to making sure that we are smart in our regulatory oversight. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. I'm going to represent, or I'm going to uh, turn this over to my good colleague and friend, Representative Pam Snyder. She's going to have to leave us shortly, but I know she has some important questions to ask. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I, I too want to commend the Public Utility Commission because I know you've been spending a lot of time. Um, I am so happy today that uh, Senator Phillips Hill and I have been blessed to continue to be annoying. That really, really <laughs> does my heart well, because I know we've been annoying to the commission. So I want to thank you for your work. Uh, I'm glad you have a farm in Greene County. Always happy to see you there. And Fran, I just want you to know, I am a very happy Atlantic Broadband customer. So thank you. Um, Tom, if you could help me out a little yep. bit. The 5G small cell bill has been talked about and kicked around in Harrisburg for a couple of years now. Correct. And it continues to have questions and um, some issues around it. So for my clarification, can you explain, it's my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, that there was an FCC de decision that does preempt the local government regulations. So I'm confused as to why we need that bill, if that's true, because the federal law should take primacy. And also, tell me what 5G can do for my rural constituents for internet service. 
Okay, uh, let me take those one at a time. Um, so the FCC third order came out September of last year, was adopted at the beginning of January this year. Uh, seven states have adopted statewide legislation um, since the FCC order went into effect, uh, including West Virginia, our neighbor to the south. Um, what the FCC third order did was provide a framework uh, for timing and responsibility of uh, fees, a recommendation for fees that they are not prohibitive uh, to the deployment of sm small cell wireless facilities. What many states have done was taken the framework of what the FCC has provided and made it more specific to, to their state. They provided more protections in there for, for their communities. So for example, uh, the FCC does not provide any uh, language in it about restoration post-construction of, of fiber. You know, so you have to go into the fiber, you have to dig up a road, you put fiber in, and then you close it back up. Well, in House Bill 1400, there's protections in there as it was introduced to say that not only does it be built, has to be restored in a timely manner to a specific condition, but there are penalties that can be levied against a, a company if they're not restored in the, in the correct manner. Um, additionally, there's protections for local municipalities that give, um, it provides guidelines for height and size of equipment and things that you can put on utility poles. But what it does say in House Bill 1400, it says that if you exceed those, then it requires it to go through a formal zoning process. So I, I think instead of taking a look at it, like thinking that the FCC third order is the cure all, I think it's taking the FCC third order and improving upon it and creating a standardization of process and fees across the Commonwealth. Um, you know, I, the, the, the second part, did I sufficiently answer that question? Okay, thank you. Uh, so the second part of that question, what can 5G do for me? Um, I, we're seeing different types of, of 5G out there. Um, you're seeing uh, a couple carriers provide kind of lower band 5G um, that should be able to get to more rural areas. Um, then you're seeing some of the carriers provide that millimeter wave 5G that's gonna be kind of a dense ur urbani urbanized area. Um, even at the lowest bands of speeds that we've seen, uh, you see almost a, a five to ten fold increase in speed for five, on a 5G network. Um, so, you know, if you're talking about, uh, one, of the, one of the gentlemen sp spoke earlier about how like 27% of uh, the, the classes are run online. Imagine what you could do on an interactive basis with live streaming uh, video for someone to take a, an online course at night while they're working a job, right? You know, I, I think there's, there's many of practical applications. Um, when you talk about telemedicine, um, you think about, uh, to share a personal note with you, I had a, I had a family member pass away last year. Um, you know, you think about she had a stroke in the middle of the night. Think about the information that could be transmitted from an ambulance ride to a hospital to get someone ready for you know whatever care that they need from the ambulance to the house and all that stuff could be transmitted over a 5g network um and then obviously you have all the entertainment aspects of people like you know viewing videos and and watching movies but it really it's the about the ability of the speed and the creation of multiple other layers of industry and innovation that come about with a 5G network. Um, I, for Pennsylvania specifically, the economic development and the number of jobs that we can create off of a 5G network is, it, it, it's, it's astounding. I mean, we today, without even doing a ton of 5G infrastructure, we have a deficiency of people that can work on our towers for us. And, and now we're gonna say, we're gonna build all this 5G network. There's jobs, we'll be pulling jobs into Pennsylvania from other states that or maybe less accommodating. They don't have maybe statewide legislation on their books. Thank you, I appreciate that. But one other thing, and take this in the spirit it's intended. What do I say to my constituents because I've been getting quite a few emails. They believe that 5G cells will cause the same kind of problems that they believe smart meters do, and that it has a health issue. So what's the industry saying to those folks. Well, I would happily defer you to Crown Castle's website. Um, we have plenty of literature on there. I'd, I'd be more than happy to share with you. Um, I think the New York Times did a deep dive on 5G networks a couple weeks ago. When we did the testimony uh, for the introduction of House Bill 1400, there was a physics professor from the University of Pittsburgh that provided testimony that talked about the safety of, of a 5G network. So there's plenty of information out there. Um, I'm, not a, I'm not a doctor. So uh, I would just point to the resource materials that are readily available. And I, direct you to Crown Castle's website. No problem. 
Thank you very much. Senator Hutchinson. Thank you. Uh, one of the themes uh, we, we've heard over, over the, the course uh, of, of these hearings uh, has been about uh, regulatory barriers, and, and, and Mr. Motzer, you uh, brought up that uh, theme too, uh, yeah. talking about unnecessary regulations of voice services and, 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 and the need to, to move beyond uh, a lot of that. Not, not saying that the others should be regulated, but to say remove some of the, the regulations that in, in today's world don't make sense, and, and I, I, I appreciate that. Uh, now, now I'm going to I'm going to say, uh, you know, you, you uh, mentioned that uh, you have filed comments uh, to the PUC through their process. Uh, uh, I'm someone who may or may not, probably most likely, may not be able to understand those the, those comments in a technical uh, manner. Uh, but I still would would ask if you could, and maybe you already have shared those uh, with uh, with the committee. Uh, uh, so. If, if there's things we can glean from that uh, going forward, that'd be, that would be helpful. Uh, as I said, maybe you'd hand me this technical paper and I wouldn't, wouldn't understand a word of it, but I want to see it anyways. So if you, could, if you could provide that, or maybe you already oh, have, I don't know, uh, but, but that'd be appreciated. Yeah, and through the chair, to the senator, yeah, thank you for the question, and, and absolutely. We would welcome an opportunity and, uh, and not just hand you the document, but work work through it okay. give you identity and, and summarize it summarize Excellent. what some of the items are obviously you know and with respect to the commissioner we don't want to go into all the details sure. specific to, sure. to that yeah today. this isn't a debate on that today but but absolutely yeah. that's absolutely that's something we can do uh one one other quick comment um, um <clears throat> that i really never thought a whole lot about uh, the fact that uh, the the cable television industry really did start in the rural areas uh, to provide service to rural areas and that's so so they have a history there uh, and uh, uh, obviously lots of coverage there uh, getting going to so many of the households in Pennsylvania uh, the only the only thing that that uh, my question today is and we've we've heard a lot today about availability versus cost and, and I'd like to see somewhere, you know, may, maybe it is available, but I'd like to see a cost comparison for for the the, the 25.3. I guess is probably the probably the the break point uh, using the the cable uh, television industry versus other. You know, I'd like I'd love to see a comparison. As you said, <clears throat> it sounds like you're very available. Uh, in, in many areas, but, but if it's very expensive, maybe there's a way that that can be subsidized. I don't know, but, but I'd, I'd love to see a comparison of costs, Mr. Bradley. I'll be happy to try to do that. And, and also, I just wanted to point out, I think it was mentioned a little earlier as far as the difference in cost between the service in a rural area versus an urban area. And, and I can tell you that the cost for our internet service in Altoona is the same as what it is here in Fayette County. Um, the only place where that varies is depending on the speed that a customer chooses to subscribe to. Great. Thank you. Thank you all. Senator Costa. Thank you very much. Just very briefly, uh, Commissioner Place, thank you for your testimony, certainly, but also providing the, the costs associated with low income folks that we talked about. So I appreciate that very much. And I think what you've heard, while you can't discuss the, the role that the regulatory environment plays in this whole large conversation, I think you heard pretty clearly from folks that it's an important aspect of what needs to be addressed. So um, you can at least take that away and share it with your colleagues. Yeah. So yeah. thank you. Um, Josh, I think thank you for the work that CenturyLink does. And I want to ask you to comment a little bit about the role that you believe that what I'll call incumbent providers play in terms of the scheme of how we drive out resources and how we find that right balance between the public and private investments. So can you talk a little bit about that and what role that should play just very briefly? Yeah, absolutely. And thank you through the chair and to the, to the senator. Uh, it's a fantastic question and I noted it both in my written testimony and here is that we do not want to ignore the significant investment that's already been made um, in this network. And that's why I focused 
specifically on the fact that although we may not economically be able to get fiber to every one of these homes, there are new advancements in technology that allow me to um, bring, and CenturyLink to bring, and the other incumbents, fiber closer to the customer, um, which increases their availability and speeds, takes them well beyond the 1.5 meg um, obligations that we have today. Um, and so I think the, the key is, is really is leveraging the existing networks that are already there um, and, uh, and any program that we create, any funding mechanism that we have ensures that we protect those investments, especially if we're already providing services. So I think the key is making sure that we don't overbuild what's already there because you're limited funding to begin with and we want to make sure we maximize that funding. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. So I have one last question. And Representative Jim Struzzi of Indiana asked this at our first hearing. <laughs> and um, we asked it in Monroe, and so I'm going to ask it here today. Um, you know, our goal is to try to quantify the size, the scope, the magnitude of this problem. Uh, figure out how we're going to fix it. And then, of course, how it's going to be funded. Um, so the biggest thing that we probably need to figure out is exactly how much it's going to cost. So I'm going to finish today by asking you all, and, and Commissioner Place, I understand if you need to, to recuse, <laughs> recuse yourself from, from answering this question and certainly wouldn't want to put you in that position. Can any one of you give me a number on what you wow. think it is? Now, we've had, we've had a, a, a very wide uh, array of answers on this, but would, as people who have to go out there and, and deploy um, this service, what do you think it will cost to pr close the digital divide in all 67 counties of this Commonwealth? <laughs> Who's starting on this one? I, I can go ahead uh, uh, to the chair. Can I give you an exact answer? No. Um, where I'd encourage the, the, the group to look is across all the programs that I noted here um, in, the, in the Pew Trust uh, website, they range anywhere from a couple million dollars to a couple hundred million dollars. But the key point is they got started. You have to start with something. Um, some of the most successful programs that we saw started with a couple million dollars and a pretty good program, some guardrails in place, and then they, they put a few programs in in those first years. Successful but had some challenges. The next year they were able to infuse more money and they tightened the reins on the program a little bit more. Uh, so. I don't think that uh, there is enough money to just write the check and be done. I think you need to, to start. You need to start so that you have incremental progress so that we don't waste any more time or any more years without a policy. And more importantly, um, there are other grant opportunities at the federal level where you start to um, forfeit points in the waiting scoring system when your state does not even have a broadband policy. We need a broadband policy. Thank you mm -hmm. very much. Would anyone else care to? to I need a I, I will. I will throw this out, Senator. Um, we had a request in one of our Maryland counties that was very rural to come up with a cost to provide our service to the curb of every resident in the county, and we did a, a cost workup. Um, it came in at about two hundred million dollars and that was for one county in Maryland. Thank you <laughs> very much. Mr. Musgrove? Uh, I don't know what that number actually is. Um, I, I, I tend to think of it as you're, you're solving a math problem, uh, that you're looking at the areas of most need and most connectivity need, because I, I mean, I think it's feasible to say that there are some folks in Pennsylvania that may not necessarily want coverage and may want to be off the grid. And, and, and we need to focus efforts in areas where the biggest need is first and, and, and work on a plan today to take care of those communities. And then uh, over time with funding through CAF and USDA and, and whatever, you know, whatever plan the, the Commonwealth comes up with is really just kind of build it out. You're, you're building your own network of rural broadband by funding and by supporting it. So where do you get the most cost-effective deployment to cover the most people from day one? That's probably how I, you know, but I, I don't know what that number is until you, can, until you know what the plan is. 
not an easy question, and I appreciate all the answers. And, and we've heard you loud and clear. It sounds like we need a plan, right? So um, thank you all very much, gentlemen. Really appreciate your testimony here today. And I would like to thank everyone who has attended, watched online, participated in the third of our fourth hearings on this topic. And I would again like to thank Senator Stefano for graciously hosting us here in lovely Fayette County. And for everyone who's listening, watching, our next hearing on this topic will be on September 23rd at 10 a.m. in Harrisburg. And we will be streaming that live so that if you can't make it, you certainly can watch if you have internet. So I now recess the Senate Communications and Technology Committee to the call of the chair. Thank you.